Stoptober. The 28 Day Stop Smoking Challenge is back and it's bigger than ever. Perfect timing! The two mics will be investigating just what it takes to quit in a series of intriguing, candid one on one interviews with sports celebrities who've quit the smoking habit for good. It's a huge goal for him! Join the thousands of people who are stopping smoking this Stoptober with the two mics on Talk Sports. Come on, join in. Search Stoptober for all the support you need to stop smoking. Good evening, I'm Mike Graham, he's Mike Parry. You're listening to the two mics right here on Talk Sport. The international break is almost over, and if it wasn't for the excitement of Wales against the Republic of Ireland tomorrow night in Cardiff, we'd all be wishing for an end to it right now. On this show, we're going to lament another poor campaign from Gordon Strachan in Scotland. We're going to ban any mention of Gareth Southgate and how boring England are. But we're also going to talk to John Hollins and Rob Earnshaw as well, two legends of the game. 08717 Coming up later in the show, it's the Porky Sermon. For those of you looking for spiritual guidance or even some inspiration from the almighty, particularly if you're Scottish. Plus, it's another round of heroes and villains as well. You're listening to The Two Mites with me, Mike Graham, and Mike Parry on Talk Sport. Oh, Florida, Scotland. When will we see? Who decides to put this on? Huh? Well, I think, I think this is a, co- a corporate decision really? to do with Scotland. But right. I mean, we don't normally the play songs about failure. We normally play songs well, why are you about success. I'm not playing it at all. Why? I, I, no, no. Are you seeking to make fun of me? No, Just I'm not making. You know, I was supporting Scotland. No, well, you you claim to be Scottish all the time. Well, and, I don't and... claim to be Scottish. My parents are from Scotland, therefore I'm Scottish. Okay, so right? it's not a claim. So how are you feeling about the disastrous failure well, of your country tonight? Like most then? Scotland fans, mm. uh, I'm disappointed. Mm. However, because Scotland are experts at doing what they always do, mm. which is to take mm. you first of all down into the bottom of the depths. So the, you are you're so you going to let me finish the answer? Down yeah. into the bottom of yes. the depths of despair, yes. then they bring you back up to the top again, yeah. right? Yeah. Only to make you. Believe believe that actually this could be the one time it's going to happen mm. and then they let you fall back down again into the depths of despair. I was listening to Chris Sutton a bit earlier on oh, yeah. and he said that Gordon Strachan since the moment we saw him at yeah. Hampden Park uh-huh. do you remember and yes. had a word with him yes. do you remember well, I do remember and, and, and he said that you know uh, I could well be out of a job next time I see you boys yeah. you know and, and all that kind of stuff mm. he suddenly adopted the Celtic style of play yeah. i.e. You know, pass it to each other a lot and well, move so, forward so start winning yeah, exactly yeah. yeah and that worked I'm telling you that, that so worked had a word of inspiration with Brendan Rogers. Yeah, yeah, maybe. That worked mm. until tonight, yeah. when he suddenly decided to revert back to... Yeah, but what an exciting game, though. Not playing the Celtic way. No, but what an exciting game. I and mean, then they, they got went... a draw, now no, they're out. On. No, but they went 1-0 down, right? Mm. And that was terribly disappointing. Then they got an equaliser. Mm. Um, sorry, they went 1-0 one, one up. Exactly, I was about to say. You're sure you're watching the same game Slovenia as me. Slovenia equaliser, right? And you think, yeah. oh, God, there's still plenty of time. Mm. Mm. Then they go 2-1 down, and you think that's it. I mean, this is the life of a Scottish football supporter, right? Yeah. Loads of people went out there. The How do you know? Army. You've never been a Scottish I've football been a supporter. Scottish football supporter since I was a kid. So you're declaring now, actually, tonight, I've officially, you are Scottish. Scottish. I've always said that. No, no, yes, yeah. Yes, I have. No. I've always no, said I've that. I've never heard that before, and I've known yeah. you 35 of years. Of course I've always said that. About band well, you had, uh, did you know my father? Yes, of course I did. Did Archie. you see my mother in uh, New York City? I did. She does still she got a speak Scottish with accent. a very strong yes, Scottish accent? She does. Yes. Does yeah. my father speak with a Scottish accent? Y- yes, he does. Was he born on the south side of Glasgow in a place called Cathcart? Yes, but you were. Was she born? It doesn't matter where you're born. It does. Cliff Richard was born in India. Does yeah. that make him an Indian? No, not necessarily. Not, but not, you, not necessarily. Not never, at all. You've never claimed Scottish heritage before. No, but I've anyway, look. I told you that my parents is, were Scottish. Scot- I've always told you that. Scotland are now out. So I've always had a soft spot for Scotland whenever they play in anything, right? Yeah. But being a Scotland supporter, as all Scotland supporters. It's a lot more interesting mm. than being an England supporter because yeah. actually at least the game gave some life to, to, to what was going on on a late Sunday afternoon mm. because they then got the two uh, the second goal equalised with three minutes to go. Yes. And I distinctly remember putting out a tweet saying this could be epic for Scotland because yeah. if they could have got that third goal, mm. it would have been tremendous. Well, of course it would have been, but they didn't, I'm but afraid. They didn't so, because that's so, what they do. And it's now 20 years since your team were in a finals, OK? It's, it's uh, France uh, 98, yeah. Uh, that's right, France yeah. 98. I yeah. remember it well. Yeah, you remember it well. They weren't you? particularly brilliant yeah, in France 98 no. either. So... Uh, uh, so that's that. England. So that's uh, a couple of people have been trying to go, sort of uh, goad me on Twitter, saying, "Oh, who are you going to support now, MG?" Yeah. Well, I will support, of course, any uh, team from these aisles no, that, goes to, you... uh, that goes to that goes to the Russian World Cup. You... I'll be supporting England. I hope they do well, yes. even though I think they're a very boring team. Mm. I will definitely support Wales if they get there, uh, and I will, and I will definitely support Northern Ireland if what they you, get there. What do you think is going to happen tomorrow night then? Wales and uh, Republic. I think Wales are going to do it. 
Because I think, like you, mm. that Chris Coleman yeah. has got something about him. Yeah, I do. I think Wales will do it as well. And I hope they've, they they've do. also got the experience of the, of, of the big games from the Euros, yeah. when they did terribly well, much yeah. better than anybody expected. Yeah. And I also think that because Roy Keane and Martin O'Neill have already been given extensions or renewals mm. to their contracts mm. because they've got them this far, Yes. I don't think the Republic is quite uh, in the position to, 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 to snatch it. I think Wales have got it for two reasons. Mm. Firstly, Chris Coleman, I agree with you, but B, the, the passion of the Welsh um, fans in Wales yeah. itself... And that's a massive, is, massive it, it, thing. Very, very strong indeed. Games and, in Cardiff. And, yeah, sorry? Games in Cardiff. Games in Cardiff, yeah, yeah. that's absolutely right. But the other thing is, I think it's terribly unfair for the world to say, yeah, but Gareth Bale's not playing, so that gives Wells a, a, a distinct disadvantage. Well, it's true, it does, no, well, well, it does. It, uh, Gareth, Gareth Bale's one of the world's best footballers, and so to that extent it is true. But what is also true is that Wales as a team are a collection of... Uh, it's a massive part put together. And one individual part going wonky, yeah. you know, if they were a car... Wonky. Yeah, going, yeah, you know, going a bit... That sort of, a, that's, a, that's a traditional term, it, That's it? a traditional uh, technical term yeah. in the sporting world. Yeah. Means that the other ten parts, plus the spare part, which I'm not saying that whoever takes over from Gareth Bale is a spare part... No, but that's true. What I'm saying is, everybody else then ups their game by 15% Absolutely to cover right. for... The missing, the missing Gareth, Gareth Bale. Bale. And also, Gareth Bale will be absolutely, uh, you know, willing them on. Of course. He'll be, he'll be cheering for them. They'll know that. And they'll maybe yeah. want to win it for him. Yes, yes. Because, you know, Gareth Bale, I mean, we were talking, uh, uh, the, the guys on the last show, Andy Brassel mm. uh, and Gabriel Marcotti, were talking about who would you miss most from the World Cup. Yeah. What they didn't say was Gareth Bale in their thing, because people will miss Gareth Bale of they will. from the World Cup, because he's they will. one of the world's great players. That's right. You know? Tim was on the last show, our, uh, our pal Tim, Argentinian Tim, Tim, Vickery, Tim as we yes. call him, Tim well, he's No, he's not Argentinian Tim, well, actually. Uh, well, no, he's Brazilian, Tim. Well, he's not even Brazilian, Tim. Well, he's, he's Eng- actually he's, English. He's he doesn't Brazilian. have any Brazilian connections in terms of his heritage. No, I know, but he lives in Brazil, you see, and that's in South America, oh, so where Argentina is also located as really? a landmass. Yeah, so just try and follow the plot, will you? <laughs> well, I'm trying to follow and, the plot, uh, but I realise that you lost the plot many, many hours ago and, uh, when you pictured yourself outside some swamp wearing the most bizarre beanie hat anybody had ever seen. They no, thought no, Benny no, from no, Crossroads no. had been reincarnated no, 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 no. Uh, around some kind of strange no. waterway in uh, the southeast of England. Listen, what happens is I get thousands, literally, of requests for pictures of me uh, feeding my ducks. And I thousands? Don't, yeah, I don't like to uh, respond to them because I feel that I do this as my unpaid charity work for my ducks, for my well, conservancy. You know you're, not, you're killing them all off, you know. For, that, for the wildfowl conservancy, right? You, you also put out two identical pictures. No, I didn't. And you, you did. No. You did. You put out two identical pictures claiming... Or oh, here's my. People thought you'd actually, literally, finally no, this time no, gone no, off the edge, no. off the rails, mad as a snake. You sent out a picture mm. saying, "This is my chief duck, yeah. dot 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 Donald." That's right. And this is uh, my second in command duck. Yeah, Horatio. Was the same picture. Yeah. of the same no, duck. No, it wasn't Horatio. No, it wasn't. It was the same duck. It wasn't identical. Uh, I'm, I, I can promise you, it wasn't because you've got to remember that mm. most ducks look exactly the same. Can you tell them apart? Uh, I can tell them apart. The pictures were identical. I can tell them apart because of their mannerisms, their body language. Oh, yeah? Just like a farmer can tell his sheep apart, even right? though all sheep look the same. They don't, uh, actually. All ducks no, look the same. all sheep do not look the they same. They do. And, and neither do all ducks. You're wrong about and, both and, of those things. And I was, I was able to distinguish. But anyway, yeah. that's uh, another issue. The anyway, people is... were seriously concerned. I was getting, as you put, would put yes. it, thousands of people yes. coming to me saying, mm. oh, are, are you, can you check on Porky, please? Is he all right? <laughs> no. Is not he all right? All. Well, you know, this is an early morning uh, recuperation I mean, process. Were you still bladderated for the night before? No, I didn't have anything to drink yesterday. What? I didn't have anything to drink yesterday. Why not? Well, I just didn't want to. Yeah, I didn't fancy So it. what, when you left the show yesterday... Yes. ...and you told me that you were going to the pub... Yes. ...that was incorrect... No, I did actually go to the pub, but I mean, the definition of had nothing to drink means a couple of pints, literally. Oh, so you did actually have two pints? Yes, but that was all. I mean, of I, what? Vodka? Uh, no, 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 of uh, of uh, English bitter, but that is because you... I do- love the fact that you think not having a drink only involves having two pints. Well, I mean, you don't reach bladderation on two pints, mm. you know. You're, obviously, you know, you can walk straight, you can see straight. You know, well, it's you, unlike you on a Saturday <laughs> afternoon, then. You, uh, you, what time you do you get home? <laughs> oh, about... Uh, what time do we finish the show? Uh, we finished the show at two. Oh, I got home by four. Really? Yeah, so that's oh, pretty good. Okay. okay and yeah. Did you go out for dinner then? No, I didn't go out for dinner. No, did I you had, cook. Uh, what did I cook last night? I'm trying. No, I uh, I had Chinese takeaway. Oh, did you? Yes, I oh, did. Did you get it at four or did you call it in? Uh, I I uh, I got home. Yeah. Then I rang up and ordered it. Right. And then I walked out and collected it and walked back. Did you? Yes, I did. Yes. Oh, very yeah. good. Yeah, pretty good. What did you have? Um, I had. Um, 
And so you just wear it in this tissue of lies. No, 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 no. Beef and a mushroom. Beef and mushroom? Yes. And an oyster sauce? In oyster sauce. Very nice. Fried uh, rice? Uh, I like boiled rice. Boiled rice, yeah. And I had a spring roll starter. Did you? Mm. Well, so it was all very good. Very nice. Anyway, listen, enough of that. Yeah. We've got to get into the big football issues. And one of them I'm going to talk to you yeah. about during the course of the show yeah. is Graeme Souness, who was one of the greatest footballers that I've watched in my lifetime, mm. has put together you know, his all-time Liverpool team yeah. from the era in which he played yeah. and since then till now. Yes. And he's finding it difficult to get Stephen Gerrard in yes. that team. Well, interestingly enough, the uh, the team that he was putting out was from 77 to 84. That's right. But he said he couldn't find a place for Stephen Gerrard in that team. Yes. Because he couldn't think of who he would throw out. Well, Which is a pretty extraordinary thing to say. Well, what, well, yes, but it's, he played in a team that won three European Cups. True. But the midfield players were not necessarily, you know, will be recognised as all-time great players. Terry McDermott, mm-hmm. uh, Ronnie Whelan, yeah. the Irish player, yeah. and, um, Case. and Jimmy Case. Yeah. And although Jimmy Case was an England international, right. and, and I thought it was a great player, very solid. that you talk about in sort of fulsome terms, not really, he? Not really, but yeah. he must have been a vital component of that team, which yeah. led them... Do you know the interesting thing he says is, he said, he said that one of the reasons that um, he wouldn't have put um, uh, Stephen Gerrard in yeah. is he said successive managers... Mm. Isn't, isn't this an interesting thing to say? Um, uh, both international and club managers never trusted Stephen to spot danger. Yeah. He said, Stephen Gerrard has been the best Liverpool player since my era, since that team that won three uh, European Cups. Yeah. But does he replace Terry McDermott in central midfield? Mm. Neither Gerard Houllier nor Rafa Benitez completely trusted Stephen as a central midfielder because he did not naturally sense danger when Liverpool did not have the ball and therefore wasn't filling spaces to stop it developing. Yeah. So he would have had to play wider, but I'm not sure he would have provided more for us than Terry Mack did. No. I think it's and a really he, interesting well, observation. It is an interesting observation. Mm. He also says it tells you what a great team we had in those days. He also yeah. says that Luis Suarez, who should get in the team, would also struggle to get in the team because yeah. you wouldn't really put Suarez ahead of Del Gleish or Rush, would no, you? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't because put anybody they, ahead of Del Gleish I mean, or Rush. Would you? Exactly no. right. Yeah. Absolutely extraordinary. So, uh, we want to hear from you uh, Liverpool fans up there because what it does do as well, mm. I think, is it, out, it sort of outlines the paucity of talent that Liverpool currently has when you yes. look at that team. Yes. And you look at every single member of that team and how good they all were. Mm. And with Liverpool now, it's just not really the case. Yeah. 08717 uh, We're going to speak to John Hollins coming up very shortly, the ex-Chelsea and England uh, player. We're going to talk to Stuart Weir about the debacle uh, that is Scottish football once again. Still 20 years and still not made it to a major tournament. And coming up later on, Rob Earnshaw is going to join us as well, looking ahead to that Wales-Republic uh, of Ireland game. This is Talk Sport. <laughs> Talk sport. We are the two mics because it's Sunday, of course. Coming up later on, there's going to be a porky sermon. Yep. Uh, if you're Scottish and uh, d- drowning your sorrows, you might want to listen out for a bit of spiritual guidance, a bit of salvation, definitely uh, in the form of Porky's advice to you uh, from the Good Book. Also, uh, we're going to be doing heroes and villains as well, and quite a few of those uh, may figure yep. uh, if you're a Scotland supporter as well. Now, a couple of uh, announcements here. One from uh, uh, William. He says, "Evening, fellas. Can I get a shout out for my brother Adrian Williams, as it's his birthday tomorrow? Right. Thank you. Doesn't say how old he is. Okay." Well, well, Adrian, have a great birthday. Not sure how old you are, but it doesn't matter. Birthdays are there to be celebrated. So make sure you do. And Kieran says, can I please have a birthday shout out? I'm 37 today and love the show to bits. Kieran from Blackpool. Mm-hmm. Kieran from Blackpool. Yeah. Birthday shout out. Yeah. 37 what age? today. 37. OK, 37 is a fine age. That's it. Yeah, it is. Fine age, and I hope you have a great day and a great week. OK, all yes. right. Thank you very much yes. indeed. Yes. Let's talk to John Hollins, former England Chelsea defender, Absolutely. of course. When England uh, were playing and he was playing for England, they were a bit more of an exciting team and an exciting prospect than uh, they are now. And you'd they have had to say. A, one particular superstar in the uh, side. Sir Robert Charlton. Who is 80 on Wednesday He's this 80 week. 80 on Wednesday. What a and who John, man. Uh, Johnny Hollins would have had the privilege of playing against. Playing against and playing with. And playing with in the England team. John, a very good evening to you. Thank you very much for joining us. No problem at all. Hi, Thank John. You. Thank you for joining now, us. Uh, well, I don't say unfortunately. I'm certainly old enough to remember watching you at Stamford Bridge. So am a, I. Uh, and at uh, Arsenal. Uh, as a kid. Mm. Um, and what a marvellous, marvellous player you were. What a tremendous uh, honour it must have been to play with Sir Bobby Charlton. Um, you, I know you were in the England squad in 66. I'm not sure if you actually played any games with him. I think I did on, on one occasion. Right. Mm. Um, but uh, the one, what was a major thing was that um, I was sort of um, actually playing in the Chelsea match, the last game that Bobby Charlton will play. Oh, really? And at Stamford Bridge. And I've got a picture of a photograph of him 
shaking hands, but we never we never exchanged shirts. That was the miss. I, I wish I had. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah. But was was that, that not something you did much in those the days? <laughs> was that was that not something you did as much in those days then? Oh no, you you just at the end of the game you you did have the one thing that you did have. Mm was that you'd had a beer afterwards in the players' bar. Right. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And you know, now they'd never meet together, and whatever the teams would be. But we did. All the, you know, Paddy Crower and mm. Nobby Styles, who, who I was in the under-23s with Nobby. Right. And uh, a good lad, lovely lad, really down to earth. Mm. And, and I think what I say to you about Bobby Charlton, really, is... The thing that you he went through at such an early age mm. uh, in, in the air crash. Yes. Um, how he came through all that mm. and did all that and became the footballer that he was. Mm, yeah. Um, and I just think he 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 set a great example mm. of get your head down, get in there, and play. And he was playing for a, a great team at. That stage. Right. He, he certainly was. Now, now, John, one of the reasons that uh, your international caps may have been uh, limited was because there were so many great players around in those days. You know, you're competing with people like Alan Mullery, never mind the yeah, team that won, Ball, the, won the. Alan Ball was there as well. Yeah, Al, Al, Alan Ball, exactly. Now, you look at that, and Bobby Charlton, was, of course, was a, a regular in the England team. But wouldn't it be nice to have a Bobby Charlton and an Alan Ball and a Johnny Hollins and an Alan Mullery around on the international scene today? Because, OK, we've qualified for another World Cup. But rather uninspiring, this campaign has been. Do you not think? I, I think it is. I think the strangest thing is we've all we are all saying that these players are stars, and really these are the English players, mm. stars, and yet they they all do their little bit, but don't do enough. Mm. If do you know what I mean, Kane will do for me as a as a centre forward. Yes. He does what he does. And he scores goals and he does everything correctly. Um, but there's a lot of players that just sort of say, "Well, I, I've done this. That's all I need to do. Yeah. I, don't, I don't just be in the, you know, passing teams on. Take a chance." Mm. Well, I mean, one of the things that, that Porky's always said to me about uh, Bobby Charlton mm. was that he said he likes to uh, shoot uh, as many shots at goal as possible because the more times you shoot the ball at the goal, the yeah. more chance you've got of scoring. But I mean, is it right to say that these players nowadays, John? have a fear of putting on the England shirt, where, where in your age, in your era, that wasn't the case? Oh, no, I wouldn't say the fear. It, the fear is, I think they want to get in to the in England and say, yeah, yeah, we're playing for England, and now we're doing, doing this. So that's another feather in your cap. Mm. But it, it wouldn't do England any good. It just, it just means that they get in the team. Um, I had one cap, but unfortunately... Um, in the game at Wembley, um, I got a very bad knock on the thigh, hmm. and it, uh, for the strange reason, it was about eight. Lasted about eight weeks because didn't have all this modern stuff now. Hmm. I, just a bag of ice on the side, but it did really sort of um, mess up because we then toured on. We went to Poland and Germany and somewhere hmm. else, yeah. uh, and missed my chance. Yes, I mean uh, that that is the cruel. Um reality of sport isn't it you know oh, it is, yeah. it, of the moment if you get the break and if you do it fine however you could be a Luke Shaw who gets a terrible break in a you know in a game oh, you know and play yeah. for Manchester United and all of a sudden three or four years of your career has gone so you've got to take the opportunity while it's there you mentioned Harry Kane he's certainly taking the opportunity if only we had a few more like him John yeah he, he just he, but he does shoot mm, he does yeah, sometimes he, you know, he will find another guy. He will say, well, he's in a better position. Take that. But there's a couple of occasions tonight, I watch the game on left foot and right foot. You can think, yeah, that's what he's trying to do. He, mm. If you get a, a ball that goes into the box, it could, you know, bend off somebody's knee or send him the wrong way. Yep. It's still a goal. And you know, Harry Kane is that kind of player. Mm. But he is also, he does get in some great positions. And... You know, people do find him, and yes. some of the some of the guys do that. Mm. Uh, um, ab absolutely. Now, now, John, getting back to um, Sir Bobby Charlton, he's eighty on Wednesday. Obviously, a legend in his own lifetime. You played um, against him and were in squads yeah. with him. 
Um, how big a thing was it to be called into the England squad in those days? Because, you know, Gareth Southgate's already used nearly 30 players uh-huh. and, 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 you know, you didn't use that number of players in those days. Squads weren't so bad. I mean, it must have been a huge honour when you heard you'd been called up. Oh, yeah. I, got, I mean, I got into, one for, into the 40 hmm. of uh, the World Cup in 66, knocked yeah. down to about, around about 30-ish. Yeah. And then, but it was just, you wanted, you know, you were part of a team and part of it, and were made to feel like a, a team. Mm. And I've got to say, Sir Ralph Ramsey had the right idea, and he, he what he would say to us yeah. was, "Now, what do we want to do? Do we want to go to the dogs? Mm. Do we want to go to the theatre, <laughs> or do you want to go for a film?" Yeah. And they said, "Oh, well, I'll go to the dogs. They go to Santa. No, we go together. Mm. Okay. We go everywhere right. together." Yeah. And, I mean, I guess you might say as well, obviously, club football has changed quite dramatically from mm. when you played it <laughs> yeah. in terms of the amount of uh, Maseratis you can now afford to drive around in, etc. <laughs> but we're seeing a story on the back of page of one of the papers tonight, uh, John, suggesting that Antonio Conte might be leaving Chelsea at the end of this year. Um, he's not. He, he doesn't seem to be a particularly happy bunny there, does he? What, what, what do you think? Well, I just, I just think he, he's been fighting the system, the system of how Chelsea have, you know, develop their team and de- de- develop their club. I think what he also wants, he wants a lot of players that are not going to get into the team and not get into the Chelsea way of playing. Mm, yeah. And I think he's moved c- a considerable amount of young players out of the squads. Mm. And now he, it looks as though he's got his own way with the people that he has bought. Mm. He'd like to have bought more, obviously. But I think he's he's still that passionate guy standing on. Well, he's not standing; mm. he's always moving around. Yeah. Mm. But but uh, I think what's happened is he's got a his way. It, managers, I think, want to say, look, I want him, him, and him. Mm. You go and get him. Yeah. And whatever you do, you know the cost is down to you know if we can afford it and can't afford it. Yeah. Um, but and I think he's won that battle because mm. he had the you know the. Uh, Costa problem, mm-hmm. and now that will be resolved soon. Yeah. Um, but you know he he's got his own way in that way, so mm. that's a major. That is, a, I think, a major feather in his cap. Yeah, I and mean, I think we've come back. We've Chelsea have come back into it again. Yeah. We're now third, fourth yes. in the league, yeah. and we've got a good set of players. Mm. And gee, I think there's the suspect. The, the suspensions that we've had mm. have just knocked it a bit, but they've still gone on and won matches. Oh, they have, and uh, they've had a, a glorious result in Europe as well. I, I'm sure they're going to have oh, a great season. Terrific. I think we're pretty sure it's going to be the two Manchester clubs and Chelsea battling for that title. John, thank oh. you ever so much for joining us, and uh, great to hear you reminisce about Sir Bobby Charlton 80 on Wednesday. Thank indeed, you very absolutely much right. John Holland's yeah. a former Chelsea mm. and England mm. player, of course, as well. Uh, talking about uh, Conte and talking about sort of futures uh, yes. and headlines and things, we'll be looking at the, the back pages of tomorrow's papers coming certainly up will. a little bit later on. But certainly I'll be asking you as well, uh, while we were talking about Liverpool there, mm. the other team in Liverpool, Everton, mm. uh, there's been a few stories this weekend knocking about saying Koeman's got until the end of October. Well, the back, of the, all out. the back of the Sunday people today, yeah. a, uh, what do you call it, a red top Sunday, says uh, Koeman's got three games. Well, they're all a bit pie in the sky. Well, when they start with those stories, it usually turns out to be true Well, the guy point. who wrote it is a guy called Neil Moxley, who's oh, yeah. a very highly respected sports Indeed. journalist. And I'm not, Good friend uh, of yours. Uh, not particularly, but no. I'm not uh, casting aspersions on, mm. uh, on what he's done. He's yeah. obviously done it with, you know, information that he has. Uh, I would like to think that that is the... Sharpest end of what uh, possibly could happen at Goodison Park. Okay? Indeed. Yeah. Cavanite says this. Correct Ray Mike Parry. Uh, hashtag crossroads. We've had the second serving of porridge. The Porkmeister is a living embodiment uh, of the 80s. Would make a fabulous Benny. Mm. From that picture that you put out this morning. Listen, it was about, you know, cold. It was cold it down was at the cold ponds. It was cold. Absolute freezing. Rubbish. I was down there very early. It was cold. You've got to remember. there? It's got its old, uh, it's got its micro sort of um, atmospherics, that uh, pond. Cause what it's time in a were you there? Seven. Well, why did you wait until one third twenty-seven to post the picture? Uh, I didn't. You I, did? No, I didn't. I posted some of them at about first time. I posted some of them was about eight thirty when I got home. So it's thirteen twenty-seven. Well, 
I can't explain that. I posted them about eight thirty. I Did don't you? know. I, you, that's been reposted by somebody. No, don't worry about that. That's your, I'm not worried about it. No, I know that's what I'm doing. I know, what I'm doing. You know what you're doing. Yeah. I know what I'm doing. And by the way, did we you know, know where we're going? Do you know that only one? Who in, are you? One in seventy homes being built in this country now. Yeah. Is a bungalow. Is that right? Whereas I hate bungalows. I hate bungalows. Yeah. I do. I loathe bungalows. Have you ever lived in one? No, I wouldn't live in one. Mm. But uh, up to time, up to about twenty years ago, one in seven homes was a bungalow. Is that right? Can you imagine that? Mm. But now nobody wants well, to live in one. Well, there's some parts of the country where no, there's nothing but bungalows. That's right, yeah, there enough, are. The South Coast is one of those places. Uh, some parts of the South Coast, popular. definitely. Places yeah. like Eastbourne. Yeah, that's that right. That kind of yeah. thing. Anyway, yeah. we'll talk more about bungalows. We we'll will. We'll talk more about Liverpool. We'll talk more about Everton. Definitely. We'll talk more about Wales. Yeah. This is Talk Sport. <laughs> Early in the show for this, uh, normally we'd be doing yep. it later, but we've got a special reason for doing it because yeah. the deliberations, right, are going to take a little bit longer right. for the competition of heroes and villains. And yep. I'll tell you why. Yep. Because this uh, particular night, mm-hmm. there are three uh, good men and true behind mm-hmm. the glass, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And they're all going to pool their resources, okay? Yes. And they're going to have, by majority, yep. who wins heroes and villains. Yes, okay. Because obviously there's three of them, so it can't be deadlocked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless one of them abstains. Uh, okay. I hope it doesn't get that complicated. Okay, yeah. All right. Yeah, so yeah, what we sure. do here is we have two heroes, two villains. Yes. Doesn't go out to the public vote, goes to a vote behind the glass. That's right, yeah. Which is necessary now because of the yeah. previous bias shown by yes. producer Ross. Yes, that's right. Who's, of course, Levitonian. Yes, that's right. Absolutely. And, uh, so are you ready to give us one of your first heroes and or villains? Uh, well, I'll let you go first, actually. You want me to go first? I'll let you go first, well, yeah. Well, you know who I'm going to go first for with my hero? Go on. Bobby Charlton. Bobby Charlton. Because Bobby Charlton... But he was he was one of my nominations, wasn't he, in our when? Uh, Winners and Losers? Was he? Yeah. I don't remember that. Yeah, he was, yeah. Well, I'm anyway, gonna, go on, yeah, yeah, yeah. competition now. Right, OK. Um, we're actually watching, as we speak, a yes. uh, TV documentary, which is on about him. That's uh, right. he turns 80 this week. He does, on um, Wednesday. He has done an awful lot of very, very good things in, on the football field. Yeah. Uh, some would say he's also done an awful lot of great things off the football field. Yes. Uh, and he's a Manchester United stalwart. Mm-hmm. I think he harkens back to... His, a, a kinder, gentler time as yep. well. You know, he was never flash. Yep. Uh, he was never seen in trouble. Mm-hmm. He never got into any do- dodgy business off the field, yep. even though he was a contemporary George Best. I mean, yes. he'd never sort of open a nightclub door and find Bobby Charlton, mm-hmm. you know, staggering about with George Best. That's right. He looked after himself. Um, he had respect for the game. Yep. He had respect for others in the game. Yes. And I think all round uh, a fantastic um, contributor okay. to the history of football in this country okay. and the world. OK. So okay. there you go. All right. Well, well done. So, Thank uh, you very much. So that's your first hero. It is. Right. My first hero mm. is a collective one, and it's the England fans who travelled out to Lithuania oh, yeah. to see England finally... They all went the... to the pub at half-time. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but they are well, heroes. It's not very heroic. No, it is, because they, they went to see us put the lid <laughs> on the qualification for Russia next year, OK? Well, no, because they'd already qualified. Uh, this is exactly why they're heroes, because they could have all said to each other, look, we're done now, what's the point of going to Lithuania? Mm. You know, we're through. How many of them went? But they didn't. Uh, about 600. Are you sure? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. You just made that and, up. Uh, no, I didn't make it up, and 490 of them were members of the official England uh, fan club. But the other 100, I think, went under their own steam. Uh-huh. But I think that is honestly fantastic. Getting out to Lithuania is not easy. Uh, I've been to uh, that uh, Baltic part of the world, OK? Have you been to Lithuania? I've been to Latvia, Vilnius. which is next door. OK. And uh, and I have to say... It was very they, wet, wasn't it? It was very wet indeed. And, and, and I think that, you know... To have representation in a game like that, which, as you quite rightly say, was meaningless in the in its outcome because we already qualified, but they still went and they still did it. They still flew the flag yep. for England in a you know a distant and far flung part of the world. Well, actually, for these guys, a lot of the fun of the of the fair, as yeah. it were, is travelling and well, seeing England. Of course, it is, regardless of how they how they play. Of, right? of course, it is. But you've got to understand that travelling fans, if they're when they're travelling travelling with their club or their country, part of the great appeal is is actually doing it. You know, and they went through it. And they they did it, and but it flew the flag for England, as I say, in a in a in a you know in a far flung uh, corner of the world. And those guys definitely are heroes for doing it. No okay. problem. Excellent. Mm. Uh, okay. Now I'm going to be telling you uh, what my th- I think my first villain okay. uh, is going to be, and I'm going to harken back to Ryanair basically because right. Ryanair have finally, would you believe, it's taken them weeks and weeks and yep. weeks and weeks. Yes. They finally decided that they now know who's responsible for the fiasco right. that has been all of these cancelled flights. Right. right? Uh, and what they've now done mm-hmm. is uh, uh, has nailed it on the guy who used to organise the rotors. Yes. Because you know how the story's supposed to be that the reason about yes. seven hundred thousand people all the had, pilots went all on holiday the, at the same all time. The pilots went on holiday at the same time. Mm-hmm. 
this yeah. is a guy uh, who's. I mean, if he was here at Talksport, yes. he'd be letting everybody off the air right. uh, at the same time yes. without actually making sure that anybody was there to replace them. Right. His okay. name is Michael Hickey, Michael uh, Hickey, and he's going to leave the budget carrier by the end of the month. Right? Okay. He was in charge of pilot rostering. Yeah. And I don't understand why it's taken them this long mm-hmm. to actually make him the villain of the piece. Right. Okay. The villain of the piece, he definitely is. But he's worked for Ryanair for 30 years, apparently. Yes, really. And uh, Michael O'Leary has said that he really doesn't want to uh, let go of him. That's right. But that, he's just going right? to have to. Yeah. yeah, OK. So he's a massive villain this week. So he's a massive villain for you, OK? Is, yeah. Right, my first villain, yeah. right, is Roy Keane. Oh, yeah. Now, uh, I know this is ahead of the massive game tomorrow, you know, between Wales and, uh, and uh, the Republic, Republic of Ireland, of Ireland uh, yes. in uh, Cardiff. But Roy Keane made a statement last week in mm. reference to head injuries in sport, OK? Oh, yeah. Now, the problem is that when it was made last week, it was, a, it was a sort of a throwaway statement. He said, you know, if people want to play a sport that doesn't involve physical contact, they should play chess. Uh-huh. And I think it was insensitive in the sense that people do suffer injuries in sport, which lead to concussion, yeah. head injuries, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Mm. And I think considering the position that Roy Keane has in the sporting world, yes. he should have been... Uh, a little bit more temperate with his words. What do you think he should have said then? I think what he should have said is, it's an issue we should all be concerned about. I don't think he should have just dismissed people who were saying, yeah, but Roy, if people get head injuries in sport, don't you think we've got to tighten up on concussion, make sure a player leaves the pitch immediately, make sure there is scanning equipment inside the ground Uh to make sure that, you know, we are not immediately... I mean... If you remember, um, you know, there have been some very serious head injuries. Um, well, goalkeepers, they have. And Peter well, Jeff Cech. Jeff Astle's and, family are also still... Well, Jeff Astle's um, family now run a campaign hmm. saying that we must be more aware of it. And this is an ongoing campaign. It's a growing campaign. And I thought Roy Keane, Roy Keane was a little insensitive to have said that. Yeah. For that reason, really? I've got to make him a villain. Indeed. You don't hmm. like Roy Keane, do you? Uh, I'm not a huge fan of his, but no. I don't know him at all. I, really? I, I find him... Um... I bet you if you met him, you'd be really nice to him, wouldn't you? Well, no, I'm not sure I would. I mean, I've never met him, I've never spoke to him, so really? I don't know. But he, he, he is a man of few words mm. and uh, and of very strong opinions. I see. Uh, you respect him for that. But I thought he was insensitive on his on his uh, throwaway comment yeah. about, you know, if you don't like uh, physical contact, play chess. <laughs> I thought it was insensitive. Yeah, because, in, because sensitivity is one of your top it is, yeah. uh, qualities, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. You're very rarely insensitive. I, I, indeed. Now, my... My uh, second mm. hero uh, has yeah. to be over yeah. in the Emerald Isle as well. Yeah. Has to be Michael O'Neill, who is of course okay. the uh, uh, the winning manager of the Northern Irish team. Yes, he's managed to get not only Northern Ireland to the Euros, yes, uh, where they did brilliantly, and they didn't yeah. do quite as well as Wales, but yes. they did fantastically well. You might remember we mm-hmm. had a, uh, an interview with Jerry T- Taggart uh, yeah. over the weekend, yeah. where he very much uh, denounced you, uh, and slapped you down for calling you working class. Uh, no, that? he didn't. No, yes, he did. Yeah. Yes, he did. He said you were a bit previous, if you don't recall. You've already forgotten. A bit previous yeah. only means, Mike, you know... It means you're, you're being cheeky and being an upstart. No, no, he yes, didn't. He, he said, no, no, a bit previous means, ho, 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 oh, no, you're being a bit laughing. witty there. No, he was you know. not laughing. In well, fact, I, I was a bit worried if he was anywhere near the studios, well, I, he might be coming in well, I don't to do some physical if, harm. If he took offence, I don't know why he took offence anyway, because he is working class, isn't well, he? No, I know he not. came from some rich family. Well, if he comes from a certain part mm. of Northern Ireland, he mm. might not be working class yeah. at all. He might be very middle class. In fact, if you come from a place called Hollywood... In uh, Northern Ireland, yes. in Belfast, that yes. is a very, very uh, upper class, I middle agree. class type type uh, part of the, the world. Jaguar. Anyway, uh, Michael O'Neill, mm. fantastic performance, yep. gets uh, uh, Northern Ireland now into the playoffs. Thanks mm. to Scotland's the demise uh, last yeah. uh, yesterday afternoon, yeah. uh, they got there without having to beat Norway. The only problem he's going to have, of course, is that all these players are on yellow cards. Yeah. So when they find out who they're playing in the playoffs, yes. they'll have to be a bit careful. But okay. what an incredible achievement. Yes. And it was, and it was uh, uh, Jerry Taggart who said mm. that out of all the home international mm. managers, mm. Michael O'Neill has done the best mm. because he's had the least to work with. OK, so fine. So you've got to call him a hero. Not a bad nomination, Thank right? You. My second hero... Yeah. Uh, Noel Gallagher, without a shadow of a doubt. Noel Gallagher? Noel Gallagher really? has um, given an interview to the Sunday Times today mm. and the one line in it which uh, makes me uh, think he's hero material, yeah. he said of his brother Liam, whose new album has just come out, yes. As You Were. As You Were. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Still swearing all over Twitter. Yeah, uh, but he's had some good reviews of it, I have to say. Yeah. I've read some of the reviews of it. But Noel said the problem with uh, Liam is he needs a psychologist. <laughs> now... That, to me, is the most honest... Uh... You don't think that's insensitive? No, I don't. I think it's absolutely honest. He mm. does need a psychologist. He needs to be able to sit down and talk to somebody about, you know, what's going on in his head yeah. and how, he's, uh, how his thinking pattern has evolved since the days of the two of them. And um, uh, Liam, by response, puts it all down to the fact that uh, years and years and years ago when they were kids, you know, he damaged his record player by mistake. Yeah. 
Well, in fact, it wasn't by mistake. He urinated over it. Yeah, it wasn't by mistake no, at all. No, exactly. Yeah. Well, it was in the sense that he didn't know what he was urinating over in the Why night. Because he couldn't find the light to get to the loo and well, all that kind of stuff. did he lift the lid up and think it was a toilet? I'm not sure, but, I mean, it said that he didn't it's deliver it. It's a very unsavoury story. Very unsavoury story. Show. Very unsavoury story, indeed. And I, I wish we hadn't got on to that, but you, it was you who revealed that it was... Well, uh, no, you were the one that no. said it was a toilet. He, he, he peed on I the didn't, uh, I didn't, I didn't. I said he damaged player. his record player, and then you well, said then it you wasn't an accident. It. You explained no, it. No, no, but anyway... You said he urinated on it. Anyway. You've forgotten what you said two minutes ago. Anyway, the point is, Liam has said for the first time on the record, you know, Noel... Sorry, Noel has said Liam needs a psychologist. You think and, that makes him a hero? Well, it does, because if you remember, <laughs> Liam sent me a very, very rude um, series mm. of uh, tweets. The one, the only one that we can really quote from yes. is where he said you're just a crap Kenny Rogers. Yes, that's right, yeah, yeah. And, and much, much worse things than that. So, yeah. to me, uh, Liam yeah, this, uh, the one with the C word, the we villain. definitely aren't going to repeat. Yeah, Liam is the villain, and Noel is definitely the hero. OK, mm-hmm. all right, my final villain, and it has yep. to be because this is obviously up to the minute and not in, in any way cold from uh, yes. reading the Sunday papers. Yes. It has to be Gordon Strachan. Gordon Strachan. Gordon Strachan, mm. who was, of course, uh, the man given the, tar- the target of get- get- getting Scotland yes. to a major tournament for yes. the first time in 20 years, not since France 98 if they've mm. been to one. Mm. They even had the opportunity to get there because it was made easier yeah. for some of the smaller countries to qualify for the World Cup. Yeah. But still, they haven't managed to do it. Right. He had a terrible campaign to begin with. It started to get a bit better towards the end. Mm. Uh, and as I said earlier, you know, the, the, the cup of, uh, of victory was dashed from the lips of the fans. Yes. Many of those of whom, by the way, had also gone out to Ljubljana yeah. in Slovenia right. to watch the game. And the Tartan army, considering the results that they've had to endure, mm. Mm. have been far more heroic throughout all of this, right? Yeah. So Gordon Strachan has let a lot of people down. He says it's not the right time to discuss whether or not he's going to leave mm-hmm. because you have to feel sorry for the players. Well, I'm sorry. Mm. I think surely now he should fall on his sword, shouldn't he? Well, if you say so, if he's and one I, of your villains... I make him the second villain of my villains. You make him second yeah. villain of your villains. OK. Right, my second villain yeah. is Prime Minister Theresa May. What? Now, I'm completely apolitical. Excuse me, I had her as a loser. Uh, when? Uh, on Friday. Well, something to do with me, mate. Sorry, that's a different competition, as I just told you. Oh, but you now, pointed out that you had Bobby Charlton as yeah, a winner. Did, yeah, I did, yeah. Well, well why does pe- you bother? It's a completely different competition. Uh, well, why did you point it out? Well, I, I, I have no reason to have to explain anything I'm running like rings to you. around you tonight. Right. You know no, that, no, you're not. No, you're not. No, I'm running rings around you, mate. Really? You're, you're flapping around. You're running now, rings around me like a duck with one leg. Uh, you may have nominated Theresa May in something else some time ago. The point is, yeah. today, Sunday, yeah. Theresa May has managed to create such a pit of chaos Within, chaos. Yes, within the political structure in this country. I'm completely apolitical. Apolitical. Uh, I didn't vote in the general election, so I, I'm neither a, a Tory supporter nor a Labour supporter nor a Lib Dem supporter. No. But the point is... UKIP. The point... I'm not a UKIP supporter. Uh, the point is that uh, the, the political landscape is so chaotic, it can only send shudders through the financial world, the economic world, the, the social world, and the rest of the world's looking on and thinking, who's running Great Britain? Who's in charge of the clattering train? Yeah. And I'm afraid that's all down to the person who sits in the highest office, yeah. which is the Prime Minister and uh, Lord of the Treasury, mm. which is the official title, First Lord, uh, title, of, the First Lord of the Treasury. Yeah. And uh, and that's Mrs May. And, you know, I just think we need to do something about it because I don't want my country to be viewed by the rest of the world as shaky, okay. which is what we are at the moment. So what do you suggest? I don't suggest anything. I'm nominating a villain, and uh-huh. it's Theresa May. OK. Mm. That was Heroes and Villains. The yes. uh, choice will be made. They can take as long as they want, because yes. there's three of them behind the glass yes. there. Uh, good men and true, and they're going to be telling us at some point later in the show which one of us won. And we'll also have to find out precisely what the score is in Heroes and Villains yes. as well. I've got a feeling it might be a draw. This is Talk Sport. Crazy, but that's how it goes. Millions of people... Talk sport, we are the two mics. We'll be getting the verdict on uh, the heroes and villains a little bit later on in the show. Yeah, I can see them all uh, stroking their chins back there, trying yes. to work out who's going to win. Yeah. A couple of quick uh, tweets. I for would you. say there's no competition, but anyway, oh, you would on. say that because yeah. you're deluded, no, uh, no. and in many ways, you can't remember what happened yesterday. No. Now, John says this Can I get a happy birthday wish from my beautiful daughter Freya? She will be two tomorrow. Now, look at that picture. If that doesn't cheer you up and make you feel happy, that little Freya, that's Freya. Well, that's lovely. Isn't that a lovely name? And what's the name of well? her dad? Her, name, her dad's name is John. John.
John, can I just say uh, an extremely happy birthday to Freya? She won't be able to work out what we're saying. Probably can't hear English words properly in her Why little two-year-old ears. Why would hear English words? Well, because she's two. So? So well, she can hear sounds and noise, but she can't interpret it yet. Of course she can. Can't speak English at two. Of course she can. No, you can't. Don't no, be silly. Don't talk absolute rubbish. Don't be silly. Of course you of course can't. she can speak English at two. No, you can't. You can, in fact, you can not only speak English, but mm. I interviewed a guy once in a school for talented children yeah. in Pennsylvania yeah. who was teaching 18-month-olds Japanese. Oh, yeah, and right, do you know yeah. why? No. Because he says when you're that young, mm. you're actually like a sponge mm. and you can learn anything. OK. So what you know about raising children, you've right. the back of a postage well, stamp. Well, if, if, um, if Freya's listening and she's only two, and yeah. she might be listening now, she might be asleep and listening to the God podcast tomorrow, can I just say a very happy birthday, Freya. You are a lovely little girl and you will have a great life. And one from Andy who says, can I get a shout-out for Zach Ryan and Horton Green under nines, undefeated so far and much more entertaining than watching England? Oh, well, I, I, look, uh, all successful clubs are good clubs, so well done and I wish your team success in the future. Thank you very much indeed. Now, yes. keep sending your tweets at the two mics, at yep. Mike Perrier, at TalkSport, of course, as well, and at IROMG. Yep. Right yep. now, uh, yep. we're going to talk to Stuart Weir, who by now, I would imagine, is well down about his third bottle uh, of Glenfiddich. Or possibly Glenn Marangi. Mm. Stuart, very good evening to you. <laughs> no, it's Glenn Fedder. I get that for nothing. Yes, very good. You are, of course, the esteemed head of sport for the Herald and Times Group, which I should also mention. Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, why Why has uh, Scotland managed to do it again? You know, take you all the way to the brink of, of what might be some joy and then just drop you again from the top of the cliff. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a genetic trait. <laughs> well, actually, it's a genetic trait. If you listen to Gordon Strachan tonight, the reason that we fail and fail miserably in this uh, qualifying campaign is that we're just not big enough. Mm-hmm. Well, he's not in big enough. Series, it, well, well, he's not big I enough. I mean, as a figure, but, I mean, I don't mean physically. I mean, just <laughs> he hasn't got the, uh, you know, the stature of a guy that can take Scotland into their first tournament for 20 years. And I thought he would have been that guy. Well, I, I, I honestly started to believe this week, and I think that's why it, it's even more painful tonight that yeah. we've actually managed to uh, to mess it up again. Right. After the result against uh, Slovakia, uh, I must admit the confidence levels were pretty high, and they were pretty high as well when we took the lead um, when uh, Lee Griffiths scored uh, this afternoon. But uh, our defensive frailty shone through. We lost a couple of goals uh, one reminiscent of the late equaliser that Harry Kane scored against the Scots at Hamden. We allowed a, a ball to drift uh, too far into the six-yard box uh, and Roman Bejic put his head on it and scored a simple goal and then had a tap-in to make it 2-1. And after that, we were chasing the game. Uh, Darren Fletcher, who uh, scored earlier, and um, put one over the bar. He set up a, a great through ball for uh, Robert Snodgrass to equalise, but it was too little too late. Uh, and so whilst everyone else will be enjoying themselves next summer, probably in Russia, um, we'll be painting the garden fence again or cutting the grass. <laughs> mm, I'm afraid you will, Stu. Now, how come you only woke up halfway through the campaign? We saw Gordon Strachan at Hampden Park during the semi-final of the Scottish Cup last season, right? And he yeah. said to us, you know, oh, it's all over. But then it must have been the inspiration he drew from myself, my presence there or something like that, <laughs> suddenly revived the campaign and almost did it. So, you know, it's a bit of a shame, wasn't it? A, a really duff start, a very, very good revival, and then, bang, failed to get over the uh, the line. Do you know, do you know why he, he this sudden revival? Because he started picking players who were actually playing well for their clubs. Hmm. He uh, he was he, he was sort of transfixed in in, in playing the likes of uh, Fletcher and Martin up front. He just weren't scoring goals. Hmm. He brings in Lee Griffiths, who scored forty goals um, over the course of a season for uh, Celtic, uh, and he started scoring goals for Scotland as well. And lo and behold, we start winning our matches. And uh, you know we've, we've gone to the brink basically by uh, completely transforming the team. Kieran Tierney, who was outstanding for Celtic, and you guys would have seen him um, you know, at various games in, in Glasgow. He was moved from left-back to right-back to accommodate Andy Robertson of Liverpool, and that worked as well. But um, we just we just blew it by giving away simple points at home. Mm. We dropped two against England, and we dropped two 
in our very first match against Lithuania. And after that, we were always playing catch-up. Yeah, yeah. Catch-up, difficult uh, place to be. And what's the press going to be saying in the morning, Stuart? Because obviously you're uh, uh, you know, well in touch with what your own paper's going to be doing. But, I well, mean, you would people... hope so. You would hope so, well, wouldn't you? Some people, <laughs> you know, some people yeah. who are the head of sport mm. are too important to work on a Sunday. Well, that's not so, Stu. You know, he might have, uh, d- d- you know, he might have sort of, um, shall we say... Stu's a man who rolls up his sleeves. Yeah, I know. So he... that his cufflinks don't get lost I in the wine. To, I used to work... I used mm. to work for me actually, but yeah, I never saw him. Yeah, never saw no. him. No, well, he was yes. out. No, he was out with his no, that's because you didn't want to see me. <laughs> no, to be fair, I wasn't in the office much myself. Mm. But anyway, listen. Um, mm. So, what, what's going to be the verdicts on the back pages in Scotland? Well, back pages and front pages. I think most people will pick up on on Gordon Strachan saying that you know. Physically, Scotland aren't big enough. Mm. He said, genetically, we are behind. In the last campaign, we were the second smallest team apart from Spain. When we had to pick a team or, or to combat the height and strength at set play, genetically, we uh, have to work uh, at different things. Maybe we can get big women and big men and put them together and see what we can do. Mm. Now, the, he, he, he contradicted himself almost immediately by saying, genetically, we are behind, by pointing out that we are second smallest apart from Spain. Spain are the most gifted team in Europe when it comes to talent. Mm. So it's nothing to do with stature and nothing to do with height. It's actually how the, the team is set out. It's how they're coached and actually given simple tasks and, you know, how, how to go about actually formating, or sorry, mm. formulating a team and a plan to actually beat teams. And Scotland are not very good at that. Mm-hmm. And what yeah. if, if he is to go? I mean, I don't know what your sense is. I mean, is he likely to walk away from the job or will they fire him? And, and if that does happen in either case, who's next? Yeah, exactly. And I think that's, that's one of the problems because there are a lot of guys out there with big reputations who simply wouldn't touch this job. Mm-hmm. And, and one, you know, one respect, you have to say, well done, Gordon Strachan, for actually taking on the job in the first place. Unfortunately, to my mind, two strikes and you're out. Um, we failed to qualify for the Euros. Mm. We failed to qualify for the World Cup. I see we Davey Moyes galloping over the horizon here, Stu. Oh, great. We, <laughs> we, could do worse. we could do worse than David Moyes. It may not be very attractive to watch, but I'll tell yeah. you one thing. Mm. We would certainly, even even that pragmatic approach, yeah. would actually start to win us a few matches. Yeah, well, I think Davey Moyes would be an ideal. Because, I mean, this, the, you know, he's a tremendous well, he's record. Else, he's got nothing else to do. No, he's a tremendous record. Tremendous record at Everton, believe me. What, by a playing, tremendous record of doing what? Nothing. Playing, playing pragmatic football. Yeah, they didn't you know, win anything, did Got they? Everton into the Champions League. That's as good as a trophy. Uh, when yeah. was that then? That was in 2005. Wasn't that the uh, the qualification for the Champions League? No, not at all. It got us into the Champions League, mate. Contenders we were. No, I don't think so. Yeah. I think he'd make it he, that bit no, he did. No, he did. He, yeah. did. he got him in because that was the same year as Liverpool won yeah. the Champions yeah, well, League. Exactly. And you had five English teams in yeah. the actual Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely right. OK, well, yeah, this is Stuart. I'm going to let you go now. Because well done, Stuart. Absolute rubbish. You're starting to agree with Porky. You better get stuck into the Glen Finnick for the rest of the night, mm. uh, along with some of your compadres. Check those back pages, Stu, so you know what's on your back page yeah. tomorrow. Exactly. Exactly right. Mm. This is Talk Sport. We are of the two mics coming up in this uh, particular hour. We're going to be doing all sorts of things. We're going to be talking to Rob Earnshaw, former Wales international, of course, now uh, Vancouver Whitecaps forwards coach and under 17s coach. Looking ahead, there's sort of Wales Republic of Ireland uh, a show coming up tomorrow, which will be a fantastic game. And you'll hear all about it, all the goals as they go in, uh, right here on Talk Sport. Also, coming up a little bit later on, the Porky Sermon uh, is going to take place. That's for anyone who needs a little bit of spiritual guidance, particularly in these dark times, if you're a Scotland fan. What's going to happen next? Uh, who's going to come up. Should it be David Moyes? 08717 You're listening to the two mics with me, Mike Graham and Mike Parry on Talk Sport. Sounds vaguely familiar, but What's I can't this tell you what it is. What's what? this drivel? Yeah. 
It sounds like a film theme, doesn't it? No, it sounds like nothing. Sounds like nothing. Sounds like nothing to me. Sounds like nothing to you. I want some Australian music, right? Right. And Australian Aboriginal music uh-huh. is all about the... What, you mean the didgeridoo? The didgeridoo. Yeah. Isn't this Crocodile Dundee music? Well, if it is Crocodile Dundee, it doesn't sound like proper Australian music to me. I wanted the old, well, it's probably you know, the theme from the, from the actual film. Well, it may be the film, the actual... It may be the theme from the actual film, you but I, wa- right. I wanted some instantly recognisable... Uh, bush music from Australia. Bush music. Yeah, you know, you know, you go uh, if you get well, lost well, in a bit like when the you, Australian bush, well, they say you has gone when bush you, and you, you never seen up, again. No, when you screwed up the Russian music yesterday, mm, yeah. you're clearly not giving out the correct instructions. No, no, people no. are not understanding what no, you're no, talking no, about. No, no, no. Don't just wave your arms about and go. Some, some Australian some, music. Yeah, I wanted some Australian Aboriginal music. The reason I wanted it is because uh, Paul Hogan, yeah. the star of Crocodile Dundee. Uh, one of the most uh, iconic films of the last 30 years, I would say. What? Uh, 30 or 35 years. You think years. it's one of the most iconic films of the last do. 30 I years? I certainly do. Rubbish. Crocodile Dundee. What rubbish he are you is, talking about? He is, believe it or not, 78 today. Yeah, well, I do believe that. And actually. still married uh, to his lovely wife, Linda Kowalski, uh-huh. who was the co-star in the film Crocodile Dundee, which uh, swept round the world. Um, well, yeah, I know, but you wouldn't call it one of the most iconic oh, films was. of all time. It was. It was about a. It was about a backwoodsman from Australia. You know, from a tiny yeah, but it was quite uh, tall, town. Wasn't it? No, it was fantastic. It was suddenly Your whipped out of his in films. Is unbelievable. No, no, bad. whipped out of his. Uh, you know, his. Uh, I would say pit-ridden sort of existence in, uh, you know, somewhere back and beyond in Australia and taken to Manhattan and had to cope with life in Manhattan and uh, yeah. everything that came with it. Yeah, well, I mean, everybody knows what the movie's about. After Linda about. Kowalski, who was it's a, not that good. a great sort of travelling journey. Have you watched it journal. recently? Yeah, I have, yeah. And you still think it's great? I think it's great. You think it's, think great it's better film. than Top Gun? It, I think it's as good as Top Gun. They come from the same era. I, I would say that's true. Both iconic films. I would say you've mm. got that right. It's mm. about as good as Top Gun. Yeah. They're both rubbish. No, Donovan I, says this. Yeah. Uh, Everton never made the Champions League. They got knocked out in the qualifying third round against Villarreal, which but is it, what I told you. I was there, and it was down to that dough ball headed uh, imbecilic uh, referee. I know who you mean. Who just You've retired. always hated him, haven't you? Yeah, Kalina. always hated him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kalina. Pierre Luigi Kalina. Yeah. But who, the bottom line uh, is, right? He ruled they, out a Duncan Ferguson goal and pitched us out of the Champions but why did League. You, but why did you argue with me when I said they didn't make it into the Champions League? It was the qualifying round and they didn't make it out of it. When you finish fourth, you are Champions League bound, right? No, and only that's if exactly you, where only we if went. you win the qualifying round. Anyway, we were talking about Paul Hogan. He's 78 today, yeah. which I think is amazing, right? Um, he started off as a. Uh, painter on the Sydney Harbour Bridge. The Sydney Bridge. Harbour Bridge, yeah, yeah, that's right. You realise that? that's another. Yes, I did know that. It's like the. Well, everybody did stories about this guy mm, because mm. he had also, of course, by that stage, become yeah. a massive comedian and a massive personality that's right. in Australia. That's right. He used to do the Shrimp on the Barbie adverts yeah. for the Australian Tourist Board. That's right. But he then fell foul mm. of Australia, didn't he? Because he was accused of not paying his taxes. He was accused of de- de- deserting the country and going to live in California. That's right. All and sorts all that of, kind things. of things. Yeah. So it turned a bit sour for him. In it, the end. it did, yeah. But then it, it, it sometimes does. However, he made Crocodile Dundee 2, which was Which shocking. was even worse. Well, it wasn't even worse. The first one was great. Well, the first because one was all right. It was so, um, well, it was so, like, fresh. It was so new and all mm. that kind of stuff. But then to try and replicate it the second time round was silly. Yes. Because I, I saw that again quite recently, actually. And what he did the is... The second one, did you? Yeah. He? It was based in Los Angeles, mm. and he went and recruited all these, like, hipsters right. who were driving around in cars. Uh-huh. He recruited them as his private army, you know yeah. what I mean? And, I'm not and, even sure I saw the second yeah, one. Yeah, it was, it was poor. It was poor. But anyway, he, uh, he was a great guy. I thought he was uh, such an affable sort of a bloke. And the other guy whose birthday is today is mm. Bruno Mars, who's 32. Why well, couldn't we have played some of his music? It's a lot better. Uh, well, we could have done, but the point is, I didn't think he was as iconic. And also, he's worth 90 million quid at 32. Yeah, well, That's I not mean, bad, he's a it? pop star, so I mean, he's a lot a of people star, are yeah. worth a lot yeah. more than that. A yeah. lot younger, to be honest. Yeah. But he did play the Super Bowl, of course, halftime show uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he's a very successful man. Have now, you not heard the song Billionaire? You'd like that. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, I that's mean, good. Now, talking about pop stars, right? Yeah. Now, you remember when we did our show in New York City quite recently? Uh, well, it was only September the 16th, so that's I remember right. it yeah. quite clearly. We actually. had a VIP package, didn't we, for certain members of the audience? Yes, we did. And they picked up on that very nicely. Thank I had you. to drink the bottle of Two Mike's wine, by the way, the other night. Oh, did you? Yeah, I was hoping mm. to keep it for a while. Because the mm. trouble is, they won't ship it, right? Mm. They'll only ship it. They ah. wouldn't even ship a case of it right. to, uh, much as we love the people at the City Winery, yeah. they don't ship cases outside the st- of, of, of New York State. Right, OK. So they wouldn't even send one to Connecticut, never mind to Britain. OK, right. What do yeah. you mean, OK, right? Well, I mean... This is an interesting piece of information I'm interesting, giving you. yeah, because we were talking about VIP packages. So here's right? what I'm going to suggest to you. Yes. Because you had such a nice time in New York. I think you should yeah. go back, yeah. buy a case of two Mike's mm. wine mm. one weekend, mm. right, when I'm with my family and obviously can't yes. go. Yes, yes. 
see a couple of people in Manhattan, mm. come back again, mm. bring the case of wine back. Yeah. Did you do that? No. Why not? Because I've got other things to do, I'm afraid. You've got now, nothing to do. No. You're feeding um, ducks at 8.30 no, in the morning. Yeah, yeah. well, I'm working here with you, and it's a Sunday, so, you know, I couldn't do that well, if, right. I'm, well, if I go, go to Manhattan. On a, we'll go on a Monday, no, then. No, what I'm going to say to you is, is that we'll probably have a VIP package for our show, our Christmas show, at... Uh, uh, the Shepherd's well, Bush. Well, you say that. What is it? The Shepherd's Bush what? Shepherd's Bush Empire. Shepherd's Bush Empire yeah. on the 17th of, uh, of December. December. OK? Yes, yeah. a week before Christmas. Yeah, nine Sunday weeks. Sunday before Christmas. Just nine weeks away, actually. Is that right? Yeah, so mm. so that's good as well. Now, what I was going to say is... I'm not sure we will, you know. You shouldn't say things on the air that haven't been uh, finally nailed down. I said we may have. Yeah. That's all I've said. Well, we yeah, may have. You, yeah. you, you raise people's hopes by well, saying Well, no, I'm not we raising hopes. I'm just, I'm just... We also uh, may not have. Good. Now, the reason I mention this is because Ed Sheeran has um, just <laughs> introduced the VIP package to his tour of America. Oh, yeah. And this report, which has come to me exclusively from the West Coast, says Ed Sheeran fans are paying £3,400 uh, to shake his hand and snap a backstage photo on his world tour. How much? £3,400. Which I suppose works out about $5,000, doesn't it? You I know? guess, yeah. Mm. yeah. Right. It's so a lot anyway. of money, that. Anyway, it says the fee has rocketed him to the top of the paint chart for celebrity VIP packages yeah. and has almost double the amount charged by his nearest rival, Britney Spears. Yes. So this is obviously a huge money-making thing. It says other stars, including Rihanna, uh, Justin Bieber, Madonna yeah. and Beyonce, all mm. charge a lot less. Really? Now, it says the VIP package on tour offer... Uh, the, sorry, the VIP package offer varies from venue to venue. Mm. But after one of Sheeran's gigs at LA's Staples Centre... Oh, yes. We know it well. Yeah. A disgruntled female follower, Jessica A, posted this report. She said... <laughs> this is for 3,400 quid. She said... Um, Amazingly poor VIP experience. Limo ride from hotel was just 10 minutes long. The lavish buffet turned out to be a sandwich and a beer. Right. And no one I saw got more than 20 seconds with Ed. A spokesman for the 26-year-old said, Promoters usually organise the paid-for guest packages, mm. along with hiring limos, organising catering and providing uh, chaperones to ensure everything runs smoothly. See, that is the problem, isn't mm. it? Because a lot of mm. these uh, promoters will do that. Yeah. And the person involved, like Ed Sheeran, or yeah. sometimes even us, yeah. you don't really know precisely what you're supposed no, to be I doing. No, I know, I know. And, I mean, like, one of the reasons I'm saying it might be awkward, mm. people were saying to me uh, today, fun enough, on Twitter, yes. will you be around after the show at yes. Shepherd's Bush? That's right. Uh, you know, in the lobby to have a have a beer. Yeah. I said, well, there's going to be a thousand people there. No, it's the 1,100. So, um, well, we don't know. Could but, be I mean, even 1,600. It, well, it, no, yeah. I don't think it'd be 1,600, but it could yeah. be, you know, as many as 1,000 or 1,200. Exactly, like yeah. The bottom line is you can't you can't really do a picture really, of 1,000 people. You can't really wade into that, uh, of course, that, that, that big a number of people. Normally, we would, we would love to. Yeah, we would I mean, to, I think yeah. the place where we had the most kind of um, crush, as it were, mm. uh, was probably Birmingham. I think the it was the Lowry, time. wasn't it? In Manchester. No, I think it was Birmingham the second time. A lot of people stayed behind in Lowry. They did, where people queuing up and stuff. Yeah, like that. Right, and you, yeah. you know, and we love to do it. Yes, but it's quite complicated. To it is quite complicated. And but the promoters don't always want you to. No, well that's true. And just to let you know uh, how much these things. Anyway, are charged, so what have you decided to charge for you shaking your hand? Well, uh, well, I'm just going to tell you what the <laughs> current going rate is. Right, yeah. Ed Sheeran, three thousand four hundred. Now, I mean, this is astonishing. You know, if only fifty people decided to do that after a concert where thousands go to see him. Yeah. That's another 150 grand. Yeah. <laughs> I can see the whites of your eyes rolling back in your head. Exactly. You know, uh, anyway, so, the so, so the going rate is Ed Sheeran, 3,400. Britney Spears, yeah. 1,900. Uh -huh. Well, I wouldn't really want my picture taken with Britney Spears, with great respect to her. I've never had any great, you know, affection well, for Spears her. Britney Spears is a pretty good pop star. Well, yeah, I agree. Justin Bieber, 1,515 quid. Uh huh. Uh, Demi Lovato, who I've never heard of. Right. Have you? Yeah, I've heard of her. Demi I've Lovato, 1,515. Mm -hmm. Now, Madonna is yeah. only fifth in the rating, uh -huh. and she charges 1,360. There you go. Beyonce, 1,280. Uh -huh. Jennifer Lopez, 1,212 pounds. Yeah. It's very precise. Very precise. Lady Gaga. Gaga? Yeah. Uh, Lady Gaga? Yeah, Lady Gaga, <laughs> 1,136. That's Lady Gaga. Yeah. Kanye West... 910 yep. quid, so we drop below the 1,000 barrier now. Well, there you go. And I'm afraid, bottom of the queue, mm. Rihanna. Rihanna. 757.
Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there are people cheaper than that. You'd be cheaper than that, wouldn't you? Um, Seven fifty. Why don't you set yourself around about six fifty? Well, uh, maybe on five hundred is around. I'd pay you six hundred fifty quid if you, if you just shake my hand and then leave. Uh, well, apparently you only get twenty <laughs> seconds to shake Ed's hand and have your picture taken, which is a bit harsh, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. How about this from yeah. um, Steve? Mm. Uh, he says Paul Hogan divorced Linda in two thousand thirteen. Oh, did he? <laughs> oh well, unfortunately that didn't last then, but it lasted quite a long time before that. Really? Yeah. Uh, and our Stoddart says an amazing statistic. This he says mm. Crocodile Dundee was the second biggest hit of. 1986. Thank you. Right after yeah. Top Gun. Oh, well, there you go. So proving proving <laughs> that yeah. you are, in fact, locked in 1986. <laughs> no, it's, it's not. The only, it's the only year no. that you remember anything from. No, it's, it pro- is. it's proving that my taste in films is exactly um, spot on no. as, it, as it would be. No. no. It doesn't mean that. What it means is that you're yeah. locked in 1986. I'm not locked Did in 1986. Did you fall on your head or something in 1986? No, no, no. And no you no. only remember everything from that year. That's ridiculous. I've seen many great films since 1986. Who won the Football League in 1986? Who won Division One? Uh, let me think. 1986, that would have been... I'll tell you exactly who it was. Uh, Everton won it in 85. Yeah. Liverpool won it in 86. There you go. Mm. See, I think this is a good one This for the yeah. porky quiz this week. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to give you a quiz on 1986. I guarantee you get everything right. Well, maybe. Because I, you know everything about 1986. I thought we'd do the quiz this week on... Bobby Charlton, because he's uh, 80 on Wednesday. OK, so we I can do that. I think we'll do the quiz we'll on... We'll put the 1986 one into abeyance. Uh, put the one into abeyance, You can definitely. do that any time. Yeah, I'll do it any time. Now, yeah. coming up next, we're going to talk to yeah. an old mate of mine, Maurice Chittenden, right? He used to work for the News of the World. He used yep. to work for the Sunday Times. Uh, he's just written a book, which is all about the end of Great Fleet book. Street. Great uh, we're book. We're going to get a few uh, 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 stories from him. Yes. He may even have a couple about you. You never know. Well, you never know. I think, he, I, think I worked with him, actually. Did you? I think I might have been his boss at some stage. I, what, at The Sun? No, at the Daily Express. Really? Yeah, I think so. Maybe. I'm sure he worked for the Express. Well, he? we'll find out. Yeah. He's coming up next on Talksport. Excellent. Stopped over with the two mics on Talksport. For support and advice on quitting smoking for good, search Stopped Over today. We've joined forces with Stoptober to get as many people as possible to quit smoking for the whole of October. Keep it up for 28 days and you're five times more likely to quit smoking for good. Over the next two weeks, uh, we will be discussing our guest's previous smoking habits and how they quit. And the guest on this very subject, but he's going to be on a lot more subjects as well, is Maurice Chittenden, who's just written a book uh, called The Last Days of Fleet Street, my part in its downfall. Porky, you'll be disappointed to know that somebody else is claiming that they ruined Fleet Street. It wasn't, wasn't just you. I didn't ruin Fleet Street, mate. I made it. I, I, I added to its legend. Did you? Well, yes. let's ask Morris if he knew about indeed. that. Indeed. Morris, a very good evening to you. Welcome. How are you, boys? You OK? We're very, very well, well indeed. We're Thank very you. very well indeed. Now, I've, I, I can't remember the last time I saw you, Morris, but I'll tell you what I didn't know until I read the book was that you'd been fired by the Sunday Times. I didn't know anything about that. Yeah, it happened last year. Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, there's no room for sentiment in newspapers, especially the way they're going. I mean, they're, mm. some of them are falling off a cliff edge in well, circulation. They are. They are. Yeah. I mean, you might say that in the halcyon days of the drinking culture and many mm. ways the smoking culture as well, you could sit at the, at the desk and smoke. Mm. I mean, I remember smoking uh, one cigarette, putting it out, somebody handing you another one. You was almost chain smoking on the back bench. Oh, absolutely. In, in Do you remember days. how the desks used to be stained with nicotine? Oh, that, yeah. Uh, people let them burn out. Yeah. Well, shocking. people used to drop cigarettes into waste paper bins that used to then. Yeah. Uh, Burn and then, and, then the, and then the smoke alarms to go fire. off. Yeah, well, didn't have smoke alarms well, in some of the buildings I worked in. Didn't have sprinklers. <laughs> oh, you know, exactly I remember right. sprinklers opening up once. But the uh, the yeah. best place to smoke in those days, of course, Morris, was in the pub, wasn't it? Because there were a lot of pubs in Fleet Street, yeah. and once you got down there and uh, got stuck into the drink and the smoking, it was very, very hard to drag yourself away and go back and do what you were paid to be doing, wasn't it? Well, absolutely. And if you, you know you, you you got run over crossing the road by somebody else coming back from lunch as yeah. well. No, indeed. Now, before we get to your, I'm, I'm sure there are going to be very entertaining stories about the, the Fleet Street career and everything else, just tell us a little bit about when you gave up uh, smoking, how you gave up, and, and how it's all going. Well, I guess, well, you say how it's all going, it's been a long time. I guess uh, I gave up about when I was about late 20s, I right. guess. I was uh, oh, about 10 a day, man. Mm, and then, because uh, it was, you know, it was, uh, it was probably something like Callahan or Wilson in government, and we had in raging inflation. So times are hard. And I wanted this new stereo. And my wife said, well, you can't have the new stereo. You can't afford it unless you give up smoking. Mm. And I had bronchitis, uh, and it's, of course, something like that. You mm. can't smoke when you've got bronchitis, can you? No. And so it, it sort of is a natural cold turkey for you. So it, it almost, your body weans off all the toxins and the chemicals. Mm. And I came through that, and, I, and uh, she'll say today, well, you know, it, it worked for you. Although 
I do admit, I went to, on to little cigars. Little, you know, do you remember those little panatellas you used to get? Yeah, I do, yeah. And, yeah, uh, I tried you, that once. I used once. to sting the office out of them. Mm. I mean, there's, a, there's an old guy called David Pryke. He, I mean, he, he picked up the typewriter right, and moved desks because he couldn't stand the, <laughs> yeah. uh, the well, smell of the cigars yeah. in the sun. That was in the in Bouvery Street in the, yeah. in the 70s. It used to be yeah. like that. How many newspapers did you work for in Fleet Street then, uh, Morris? In total, I counted it up. Uh, I was, I, I've worked in six newsrooms, yeah. Six That's newsrooms. That's quite good, isn't it? Corky yeah. thinks that you may have worked with him at some point. Do you remember working it, with Mr Parry? It's, yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, he thinks so. Uh, That's the a bit Express. Of... The Express. Yeah, of the Express, yeah. I was a super news editor. Five years, longest serving news editor ever. Well, um, that's probably uh, it then. I thought, I thought, uh, around Jill Turner. Did you take over Jill Turner or what? Uh, did I take over from who? Jill Turner. No. Jill Turner was never the news editor. She was. Well, she must have been after you left. No, she was. Uh, she was something else. What was your job at the Express, uh, Morris? Oh, I was only a reporter, only oh, a shifter, in fact. Oh, yeah. I see. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, I, I was probably your mentor or something like that. <laughs> well, you you what, um, you've obviously had such a massive impact on his career that he doesn't remember you. Exactly. Doesn't remember you at all. Yeah. Now, yeah. I mean, this book is uh, uh, not one I've had a chance to read cover to cover yet, but what? I've picked out. I've mm. picked out a couple of fantastic, uh, uh, fantastic little uh, bits and pieces from it, and. You you were at Zabruga, of course, which was terrible mm. uh, a terrible story, but a Shocking. story where almost everyone from Fleet Street went en masse, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, I mean, you, couldn't, you wouldn't believe it these days, but uh, we said, well, how are we going to get there? Because it happened on a Friday night about 6 o'clock, 7 mm. o'clock, I think. Yeah. Did, yeah. And I was working with the Sunday Times then. Mm. and So it was going to be a big story that Sunday. Uh, so, of course, all the ferries were closed. So they said, oh, well, we'll hire a private jet. Mm. I mean, the idea now of hiring a private jet to fly across the across the channel to cover yeah. a story, you know, yeah. what would happen? The, the news editor would say, well, let's ring a, a, a stringer in Brussels and get them to cover or something, mm. and then let's rely on the wires. But, no, I remember we, we sped down to uh, Gatwick in... Uh, uh, Mazda Mahmood, you, you remember him, the fake yeah, shake? Yeah, they do, the fake yep. shake, yeah. He was working at Sunday Times then, mm. and uh, he drove, and uh, uh, so we zoomed down to um, zoomed down to Gatwick, flew over to uh, uh, Bruges, I think, or Zeebrugge, mm. I can't remember, Bruges, and then uh, just nipped up to Zeebrugge. Mm. And uh, so we were on the case pretty quick. Yeah. And uh, I remember we, we got to the hospital, and... and, and Mazza, uh, naughty boy, started claiming I was a relative and uh, uh, that he was my driver, and uh, we sort of went around the hospital interviewing survivors. Shocking behaviour. Absolutely it awful. Was. You couldn't I do mean, it now. It would be frowned upon, mm-hmm. uh, frowned upon today. That, um, that was where I actually uh, gave the moniker to... There was a, an English bloke there, right, and uh, he stretched himself between a staircase and a wall so that two other victims in the boat that had turned over could climb over him and get out. Right, like a uh, human gangway. No, I labelled him the human bridge. The um, human bridge? Yeah, the gangway uh, would have been better, no, Mike. <laughs> no, no, it was the human bridge. Yeah. And, and okay. I got that headline into the Express. The human bridge! Really? Who saved that's 30 sort of people. Your, that's one of your favourite stories. Yeah. Isn't yeah, it? We're yeah, actually yeah. talking to Morris about <laughs> yeah. his career <laughs> yeah. and his book. <laughs> well, not about yours. It's in trouble with Porky. Same isn't story. It? He doesn't think anybody's got better mm. stories than him, but I know you have. Mm. What about mm. the first time uh, ever a journalist was involved in the telephone bugging of a member of the royal family? Yeah, that was naughty. That was... Uh, Tell us about that. Ku Stark. Oh. Um, uh, and uh, what happened? We got a call at the News of the World one day, and uh, uh, the news editor looked around, and, uh, and I think I was the only guy in the room, and he said, uh, uh, Right, a guy in a white jacket will meet you in the pub. So, mm. Was uh, that Bob Warren in those days? Uh, no, I think it was. Um, I think Bob was, was on a holiday. Oh, yeah. right. So uh, it's probably the deputy news editor. Mm. Bob Warren, that was a lovely guy. He was. Uh, and uh, so we met this guy, and he was uh, he worked in a, a telephone exchange mm-hmm. um, down near Blackfriars. And we, I think we met him in a pub. Uh, what's the famous boxers pubs down there? I can't remember its name. But um, where Henry Cooper used to box a train years ago. Well, I can't there's the that. Ring, which is very near to the Express Building, the Ring yeah. pub, which is near Southwark uh, Tube Station. That yeah, was, it could uh, have been that. That's a famous boxing pub, yeah. That would have been that, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And he, and he uh, I mean, his, uh, I mean, he he could listen in to phone calls that Koo was placing to to Andrew at Buckingham Palace. Mm. So Koo's always claimed that she was, uh, uh, she was, she was bugged. So uh, was this the first, and, was this the first proper time that that was actually done then? 
I think it was, yeah. Mm. yeah. We say, I think I say in the book it was the first time a uh, member of the royal family was hacked. Although, mm. in fact, they were hacking, I think they were hacking, we were hacking uh, Coup rather than, than Andrew. Yeah. Well, I, I, I found Coup Stark, by the way, Morris, when, uh, when the romance yeah, was revealed. He comes revealed. another Porky Parry story, which yeah. you may yeah, remember yeah. is probably not entirely correct. No, no, no but, oh, what was it? Yeah, no, I, we found her. She was uh, she was scuttling around London. Nobody could find her, and I went out with the photographer. And eventually, we tracked down an address where she was. And a motorbike turned up, she, and this person got off the back. And our, my photographer went bang with this massive flash. And we didn't know until we got back to the Daily Express uh, picture desk that we'd actually taken a picture of her because the flash went through her visor. And it was well, the first funny picture. You say that because I say in the book mm. that. That's the way she used to avoid people outside the flat. Yes. Because um, all these snappers would be outside waiting for her. And, of mm. course, in those days, there was no such thing as digital photography. No. So the, the, so the photographers had to send their film in on a bike. That's right. So all the time, bikes would come up to collect the film. Mm. She had the clever idea, driving up on a bike with the helmet on and slipping into a flat. That's right. So until you spotted her and, and took that picture, yeah, that's right. nobody, nobody... That was a very clever ruse of hers, yeah. No, nobody knew it was so her. It was. No! no. So, so what happens now uh, for you, Morris? I mean, have you got any sort of um, a tabloid or newspaper uh, sort of contacts left? Have you got any places that you still want to work? Or is, <laughs> or is it all over for you now? It's just is memoirs. it all over for me? Is it, you, can do, you can do eight uh, volumes of memoirs like Alistair Campbell. Well, I, I might well do. I mean, this one's going very well. I mean, it, it made the uh, Amazon top 5,000 briefly. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, they, they've got about 8 million books, so that's pretty good. Mm, it is pretty good indeed. And um, so many of us have, you know, thought we would always write the book about Fleet Street, but very few of us ever got round to it. So I have to take my hat off to you, Morris, for actually concentrating, because it's not the sort of thing that we're famous for, is it? It's you not. Know, I mean, we can, down. we can hammer out 1,000 words, can't we, yes, Mike? Yes. But when it comes to 80,000, it needs mm. a bit of discipline. Yeah. But I found I did it by pretending they were all sort of all the chapters of four thousand uh, long features and doing it that way. And so it's a, you know yeah. it's quite episodic. But yeah. 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 But anyway, it'll be a great read, and it'll take us back all those years to yeah. when, uh, you know, working in Fleet Street was a joy, not something you had to do with a uh, university degree indeed. on your card. But Morris, anyway, Morris. Morris, thank you very much indeed. And, of course, despite this, uh, there'll be people listening to that yeah. saying, all those terrible things that the journalists used to yes, do. Yeah. Yes, that's true. It was mm. a very different world then. Very different and world. There was no internet hacking going on. No. There was no snooping going on no. because information was very much harder to come that's by. Right. But, was... Morris, listen, thank you very much indeed. The last days of Fleet Street, my part in its downfall, uh, it's out. Out now. Absolutely right. And just to remind you all that we also talked to Morris, Morris Chittenden there about Stoptober. Stoptober is those people who've successfully given up smoking, trying to encourage others to do the same. Stoptober is back and bigger than ever. For support and advice on quitting for good, join Stoptober today. Stop with all the support you need to quit by searching Stoptober or download the Stoptober app. Stop Tober with the two mics on Talk Sport. Come on, join in. Search Stop Tober for all the support you need to stop smoking. That song, yeah. What song's that? Uh, it's into the danger zone. It's the Top Gun the, the, theme, isn't the, it? Yeah. Well, it's not actually, you see, because I, I think that's a great song, Into yeah. the Danger Zone. But yeah. it's the second song in Top Gun. The well, main one is uh, Berlin. Take your breath away. Yeah, but that's the one you recognise as when he's driving the bike. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, yeah. How about this Andy? Yeah. Andy says, "I've got uh, now images of Porky's Marty McFly mm. trying to get back into 1986." No, not at all. Why no. do I don't know why people do that? You see, you give completely the wrong impression of me. So I'm stuck in some time warp from years ago. I'm not. I'm modern man. No, I'm right not. up there with it. No, but you know I everything am. there is to know about 1986 and not much else. I do. I know everything that I need to know about every year since 1986. Really? Don't worry about it. I was at the top of worried. the tree. I'm not I was the news editor of a national newspaper. Well, you keep, you keep making I these was, mad claims, but nobody uh, seems to remember them. I was at the... Well, you Morris know, the, Chittenden was in Fleet Street for decades, yes, right? And yes. he doesn't seem to remember any of the stories that you're telling me. But he was a lowly reporter he for most of his life. He was a reporter for national yeah. newspapers yeah. across the, uh, the uh, whole and spectrum. And I was the news editor, US editor and executive editor uh-huh. of a series of national newspapers. Really? I, my career in Fleet Street was at a much well, no, more two, elevated level. Two papers, but you never worked for a broadsheet, did you? 
Well, you, you would want to work for a broadsheet. Most broadsheets Sunday were Times dull, is one of the greatest boring, newspapers in the world. And, uh, Absolute rubbish. And if they came out weekly, I don't know what people do six days that they're not uh, working for a newspaper okay. that's going to publish okay. tomorrow morning. Why don't you slag everybody else off apart from yourself? No, then? not at all. Kevin says, Aloha, lads. Do I finally get a mention after meeting you both mm. in New York City, mm. living in Hawaii? You might remember Kevin. Do you remember meeting him at uh, yeah, the Overlook Bar? Yes, of course uh, I do. from Hawaii. Yes, I do. Very, I remember him very much indeed. Mm. Thank you very much indeed uh, for listening, guys. Great to see see you. Kevin, his name is. Uh, Kevin, that's yeah. what I'm saying, yeah. Mm. Lady Laura, you read out before, yeah. she's talking about being on the Bladderation Trail yes. with her friend. Do we know who her friend is? I don't know who her friend is. No, okay. I've never seen her friend okay. before. Well, never mind. Would you like to know who her friend is? Well, if she'd like to tell us, that'd be nice. Mm. We can give her a shout out as well. How about this from Donovan? He mm. says, I can't believe Porky didn't wish Sheila Ferguson a happy 70th today. I thought he had a soft spot for her. Uh, well, I think she's a lovely lady. Yeah. Uh, she is a friend of a friend of mine. Yeah. And uh, I have to say oh, that... Well, you wish her a happy birthday. I'm going to wish you a very happy birthday, Sheila. And I also want to say you are one of the most elegant ladies uh, that's been around in the music scene for many a long decades. She is, decade. of course, one of the three degrees. Exactly. Chris says Liverpool yeah. did the double in 1986, beating Everton 3-1 in the final. Yeah, Does no. Paul, you remember that? Yeah, of course I remember it. I don't uh-huh. like to remember it. We finished second in the... In the um, First Division, and we were runs up in the FA Cup. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was painful. Ian Rush uh, destroyed us in the Cup final. Yeah. And uh, sadly, uh, we lost the league when it was the one season Gary Lineker played for us, right? Uh-huh. It was 86, that's right, yeah. And we played a game, I think it was away at Wolves, but I will stand to be corrected by anybody else, where we drew... And we had loads of chances to score, and we uh-huh. didn't. That would have got us the title. Okay. But anyway, uh, David yeah. has spent this picture in saying there's only one memory from 1986 that you need to worry about, and it's that one. Yep. Which you will, of course, recognise. Yeah, that's the hand of God. The hand of God. Absolutely, yeah. Exactly yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, now, Jim says, I would cheerfully pay Porky £1,600 for a photo after the gig, as long as he accepts Monopoly money. Uh, well, I don't accept Monopoly money, because uh, one of the things that does worry me at the moment is the state of the economy. Really? We need more stability in our political um, uh, framework. Really? Are yes. you getting worried about the economy? Yeah, well, of course Are you I am. fearing poverty? Yeah, well, I would fear poverty if it, poverty was on the horizon. OK. Well, now, maybe jo- it's now time for this, then. Jo- Eh? It's time for this. What is it? It's time for this. Right. Has anyone paid attention, man? All right. That is, of course, now time for the Sunday sermon, uh, the Porky sermon, because it's only Sunday for another 20 minutes. Yes. So uh, the selection today is from the book of Job. Oh, Job. Uh, so I'm just going to read you out it's a quick... It's one of my favourite uh, books. Is it? I'm yeah. going to just read you out a quick uh, Which verse line. Which uh, I think it's verses 1 to 4. OK, I love it. Um, and uh, I'm going to read it out to you. Yes. And then you're going to interpret it back for everybody else. Indeed. OK. Uh, in the land of Uz, there lived Uz, a man yes. whose name was Job. Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. Mm. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, mm. 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, mm. and 500 donkeys, yeah. and had a large number of servants. Mm. He was the greatest man amongst all the people of the East. Yes. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their mm. birthdays, mm. and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Yes. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, mm. he would sacrifice a burnt offer for each of them, thinking, mm. perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Mm-hmm. This was Job's regular custom. Yes, OK. So I'm going to hand it to you mm-hmm. now for you to uh, yeah. interpret. Uh, try and make sure you keep it upright, otherwise yes, will. Uh, the words will be moved. No. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. That is brilliant. Yes. That's what you have to do in life. You have to fear God or fear the Almighty, whoever your God is, OK? Uh, and shun evil. Evil is an evil thing, OK? Well, you would say that. You sound yeah. like Theresa May. Yeah, no, no, no. Brexit is Brexit. Now, he had seven sons and three daughters. That means he's a great family man, obviously. Uh-huh. Ten children. Yes. Uh, and he owned 7,000 sheep. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just um, uh, emphasise this man's possessions. 7,000 sheep. That's a lot of sheep. That is. 3,000 camels. That's an awful lot of camels. I don't know where you keep 3,000 camels, but, I mean, that is a huge number of camels. Camel he, stable. He had the biggest collection of camels in the history of the world, mm. in, uh, by the sound of it. He had 500 yoke of oxen. It's an awful lot of yoke of oxen, that. Awful lot of oxen. Yeah. And he had 500 donkeys. A lot of eeyaw, eeyaw, eeyawing going on, right? <laughs> because 500 donkeys make an awful it's lot of noise. It's not very biblical, that. And he yeah. had a large number of servants, right? Now, he's the greatest man among all the people of the East. Now, what this is saying is, 
You will know at the moment that within this country there is a battle going on between the principles of socialism and the principles of capitalism, oh, okay? Yeah. Right. And I'm on the side of the capitalist because I believe that capitalism is a more efficient economy than socialism. Uh -huh. I've never come across a country yet in the history of the world where socialism has actually made people better off. Uh -huh. And I've never come across a country in the world that practised socialism without it ending up in economic chaos and usually dictatorship and brutality. Yes. That's usually what it, it, it ends up as. Indeed. You know? yeah. I'm not, not, not to say that um, extreme politics of the right do not also end up in brutality and dictatorship. Well, dictatorship's they do. Dictatorship's generally not good. They're, they're not good at all. No. But a lot of them have been socialist dictatorships. Yes. You know, old uh, Joe Stalin managed to kill about 30 million of his own people he by did. starving them to death, death in the Ukraine. Mm. It's not a good thing. No. Now, Joe was such a good man that nobody would starve to death under his principles because with all his oxen and his donkeys and his sheep and his camels, right, mm. this guy was clearly a prosperous man. But he, he became prosperous on the principles of capitalism. But he also now, worries about his children, doesn't he? Yeah, of course he does, yeah. Now, the other thing he says is... Um, his sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays. They'd invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. This is the strength of the family. The strength of the family getting together and celebrating through bladderation. OK, because there's nothing wrong with bladderation. They had a lot of bladderation around in the biblical times because, of course, they had a lot of grapes and they used to tread on these grapes in huge vats and the grapes would then turn to mush and the wine would flow out into bottles and they would well not bottles earth and where into, jugs into, or into barrels maybe. earth and jugs barrels and yeah. they would drink them all so there's nothing uh -huh. wrong with getting bladderated right. particularly as early in the morning the following morning he'd sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them thinking perhaps my children have sinned and cursed god in their hearts yes so what he's saying is there is room for sinners in the kingdom of your god you know, in heaven, as you may interpret it or call it, providing you reflect on your excesses, OK? Mm, yes. But the point is, what he's basically saying here is, do not be afraid to be expansive in life. Do not be afraid to acquire possessions and do not be afraid to then exercise your right to enjoy your life through your possessions. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with it. I thought you'd this like is a great sentiment. passage. I thought you'd it's like a great passage. The book of Job is a good book and I heartily endorse it. You know, I, I, what is the chance to say at the end of the, uh, the, um, uh, it says I, I, I not even recommend it to the house. No, it's not like recommended. That. I, I, uh, I recommend this budget to the house. Yeah. Uh, and Dorset. Yes. Well, I endorse the book of Joe. Do you? Very good. That was the Porky Sermon. Thank you. We are the two mics. We are. <laughs> Talk sport. We are the two mics. We've got loads more coming up. We still have to get the uh, uh, the result vote, by the way, on um, yes. uh, our heroes and villains. Yes, we've not that we yet. haven't got yet, but we may get that in the next hour or mm. so. Uh, Dave Morgan says Crocodile Dundee Two was set in New York in Australia, but the third film was called Crocodile Dundee in Los Angeles. Oh, was that the one? So yeah. I think you're confusing okay, two. Yeah, and three. yeah, probably. Am, I'm yeah. pretty sure I didn't see the third one because yeah. I think the second one was pretty bad. Yeah. To be honest, mm. uh, but there we are. Anyway, what is not going to be pretty bad and probably what could well be the highlight of this entire international break. Yep. Uh, could well be uh, the game tomorrow night uh, down in Cardiff between Wales and the Republic of Ireland. The current state of affairs, Porky, as I'm sure you know, Serbia mm -hmm. uh, are on 18 points, top of the group. Wales on 17 points, second place, and Republic of Ireland uh, third with 16 points. Yep. Now, obviously, one of those teams... Um, Either probably Serbia or Wales will, fall by the wayside. will top the group, and one of them will fall by the wayside, yeah. as you say. Yeah. Um, I wonder uh, what Rob Earnshaw, who is, of course, now uh, over in the US of A, thinks about Wales's chances mm. without Gareth Bale. Rob, a very good uh, evening to you, and welcome. Good evening. Good yeah. evening. I'm actually in Canada. Oh, are you? <laughs> okay. Vancouver in Canada. <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool. Now, yeah. listen, uh, fantastic mm. opportunity for Wales, obviously. Uh, bitterly disappointing that, that, that Gareth Bell can't be playing because of his injury. But they did brilliantly um, in the first match. And uh, they've got a, as good a chance as any, really, of topping the group, haven't they, still? You know, uh, and first of all, it is the highlight of the weekend, by the way. Yes. <laughs> this is that's what's going to be. Um, it's, it's an amazing game. Uh, unbelievable how it's kind of turned up to, to obviously, uh, Wales playing Ireland. So it's, um, you know, we've got a, a, as good of a chance as anything, and uh, we've set ourselves up uh, for the perfect ending. So um, it's really exciting. And, um, and I believe they can do it, you know. I believe they can do it. But um, it really is... Uh, it really is something to look forward to. This is what football is about, you yeah. know, like the way it kind of turns around and, you know, big crunch game kind of, you know, uh, winner takes all kind of game. Yeah. So it's, it's amazing, really. 
Yeah. I think, Rob, actually, the momentum is with you because you had a slow start to this group. I think five consecutive draws, yeah. uh, you know, where points were being, you know, um, sh- you know, lost here, there and everywhere. But the momentum is now with you. A fantastic result um, in Georgia. And I think that momentum will now carry you through, allied to the fact that the game, of course, is in Cardiff, which is, you know, not to, uh, to, to use an old cliche, but it's worth an extra man. Oh, man. It, we will have an extra man, probably around an extra 30, 35,000 men just right there and women and children and yeah. everything. But uh, you'll, you'll have about, uh, about I, I don't even know how many millions, you know, really just getting behind the team. So yeah. it's, um, it, it really it, it does make a difference. It does make a difference because uh, that home support, it, it really is uh, amazing. You know, I've, I've, I've been in around there, yes. played it. And, yes. Um, you know, I've been a kid and, and, and been a fan and played. And, you know, the players are exactly the same. They've been that kid that goes to the game. And then now they're playing and they know everything. They, they, they really know how it, uh, how it feels and how it affects. And, uh, and the crowd really get behind uh, the whole nation. And, and whatever happens, yeah. they'll be behind them. And that's the key thing. You yeah. know, um, uh, that's, that's going to be the biggest thing. So it's... It's, and, I, uh, and I think Chris Coleman as well has such a good communicative process with his players. I think that they go out on that pitch knowing exactly what he wants from them. You know, I think some managers, and I'd put Gareth Southgate in, 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 in this bracket, a little bit airy-fairy about, you know, their, their philosophy and what they want and how to play. Chris Coleman talks from the heart to his players. He's very expressive. They know exactly what they've got to do. Well, I mean, uh, I think that's a, I think that's a Welsh thing. I think we, yeah. we as a, as a country, we we generally like that. We we're passionate. We we know what we want. We we uh, we express it. We we're very humble, um, very unselfish, but uh, but really driven. I think that's uh, it. Kind of captures that team. Um, mm. And I I was actually with them a few months ago in in May, um, I believe, and uh, spent a few days with, with Chris Colm and the, the, the players and, and right. training and everything, and just behind the scenes. So uh, uh, one of the things, one of the big things I kind of took out of it was, uh, was how, um, first of all, um, we, we were doing a lot of really amazing, brilliant stuff behind the scenes, how we prepare, how, what our approach is, the yeah. detail. The, it's amazing detail that really is behind the scenes. And uh, just to go into a game and people don't see and, and how uh, kind of coming away with it um, yeah. after a couple of days, I was just thinking, you know what, we're, we're in a great place. You know, mm-hmm. the players are in a great place. They really are driven. And the biggest thing is they're a team, whether it's the, the coach to the players and, and the players to, to, uh, to the coach. Yeah. They're a team and very unselfish. Yeah. Very, very unselfish. Yeah. Yeah. Willing to really willing to do everything possible yeah. in their uh, in their efforts to win, mm-hmm. but also to play well and, and to try and get the right results. So it's uh, it, it, that's that's what I kind of took out. So you can see it on the pitch. Yeah. And I, I got to mention as well because I, I mentioned this one of the uh, another interview I did the other day is uh, it's it, people people. Yeah, I think obviously Gareth Bell's you know is our best player. We've mm-hmm. got Aaron Ramsey and and uh, Ashley Willen, all these great players and everything. But uh, the biggest thing that we 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 don't kind of point out is, mm-hmm. is defense how solid we are how good yep. we are defensively yeah that's the reason that in this, uh, in this position uh, ready to qualify uh, that's that's the whole reason you know absolutely right mm. well i think everybody saw rob the the the, the teamwork and, and the team spirit because gareth bell wasn't playing and, and you know the team performance uh, the other night was was fantastic i mean chris coleman's talked about how this is now a golden era for Wales and, and obviously having got to the semi-finals of the Euros, mm. um, if it was possible for Wales to to um, to qualify by coming top of the group, that would be brilliant. But if they do go into the playoffs, who are they likely to face, and and, and who I suppose would would Chris Coleman want them to face in that? <laughs> do you know? I I don't actually don't think it matters. I think whoever we face, because especially now looking at it and, and being at the Euros and us getting to, this, uh, to the stage that we got at uh, last summer, um, it, it really doesn't matter because, you know, we faced England, Portugal, mm-hmm. Belgium. Uh, so we faced all these guys, you know? So it's, it, 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 I don't think it really, it really is going to matter. It, it's just going to be focused on getting past whoever it is. Um, and I don't think we'll be scared of anyone. Uh, and I think there'll be uh, whoever we face will be, you know, if we do get through, it happens and everything like that. We'll, we'll see. But if it does end up something like that, 
I don't think we will have anything to fear. I think mo- most uh, people will kind of fear how dangerous we are as a team. And, and I think it'll be, it'll be the same with the Republic of, uh, of Ireland tomorrow. Yeah. You know, there'll be, uh, you know, we haven't got Gareth Bale, obviously. Um, but we we got so many danger people, you know, so many people that can score a goal and, and cause trouble and, and good players, you know, and really underrated, you know, and I think they should start getting the credit because uh, this work, by the way, this, you know, the reason we're in the position and we finished uh, in the position that we were in, in, in the qualifiers last year was is it's taken a lot of patience and a lot of years because this team has kind of been together for, I'll probably say six or seven years minimum, you know, apart from one or two here and there, you know, which kind of get added on every couple of years, you know, which that's how international it is. Um, it's, it's really is something that uh, it's been a lot of patience, but a lot of work. These players have really got to know each other, and it's taken a lot of patience and bad results turned into good results and and good good team now. You know, and mm-hmm. I, th- I think that's uh, it's a credit to everyone working uh, yeah. within the team. Well, I wish you the very best of yeah. success, Rob. I think it's going to be a fantastic occasion. It, will. it certainly is, and oh, I know, I'm, excited. I'm surprised you're not flying back for it. To be honest, uh, Rob. Yeah. Oh, I, you know, I I I looked at it. Mm. <laughs> I looked at it, but. I, I, unfortunately, I've, uh, I've, I'm coaching on on Tuesday morning, so uh, I've got to be I've got to be in work. You know, I've got to mm. get to, to, mm. to do my work. But uh, you know, I'll, I'll be watching. I'll be excited. I'll be you'll I'll be, be there in my, spirit. Uh, my my friends on. Yes, of yeah. course. Yeah, we we'll be right behind it. Brilliant, so, um, tremendous stuff. Well, Rob, I'm okay. sure there'll be a corner of Vancouver that will go well Welsh for the night mm. uh, as you're watching that uh, tomorrow because it's going to be a fantastic game. Rob Earnshaw mm. there, uh, of course, famously uh, a former Wales international himself. Scored a lot of goals for him as well. Mm. Uh, we've got loads more coming up uh, in the next hour. We're going to be talking to uh, Professor Chris Turney, yeah. uh, who's Professor of Earth Science and Climate Change at uh, the University of New South Wales mm. down in Australia. This is Talk Sport. Stoptober. The 28 Day Stop Smoking Challenge is back and it's bigger than ever. Perfect timing! The two mics will be investigating just what it takes to quit in a series of intriguing, candid one on one interviews with sports celebrities who've quit the smoking habit for good. It's a huge goal for him! Join the thousands of people who are stopping smoking this Stoptober with the two mics on Talk Sports. Come on, join in. Search Stoptober. I was studying my property journals oh, yeah. because I have an interest in property. Uh-huh. It's part of my investment portfolio. Indeed. I came across an amazing statistic that uh, the death of the bungalow could be less than a decade away. Decade, a decade. Why? Within ten years, but what be... happens to all the bungalows that are currently there? Well, they're there. They can stay there, right, but okay. not building any. They're nobody's... not going to start like bulldozing them away. No, not going to bulldoze them, but no. nobody's building any new bungalows. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now we have an aging population. Yeah. <coughs> excuse me, which we all know about. Well, you're one of the aging population. I would have thought. The you? aging population eh? puts pressure on the national health service, uh-huh. puts pressure on social services, and all that kind of stuff. But local councils and all that. Y- yeah. Despite this, uh, this aging population. Mm. The current rate of decline of bungalows means that within nine years, according to uh, analysis of data from the National House Building Council, Uh um, uh, so few are being built that none will be built within 10 years. But why are they not being built? The people don't want to live in them, is that what you're saying? It's more profitable for house builders to construct blocks of flats for the elderly on a single plot of land. It's all about money, isn't it? So it is. Mm. So, for instance, you know these companies that specialise in building these sort of warden-assisted places, all that kind of stuff. Communities, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Mm. and and there's a very famous company, isn't there? Who I don't want to name on air. I don't know. Who who build just um, uh, apartments specially designed for older people? Do you involve yourself with them? No, I don't involve myself with them. But you you can see them all over the place because they have things like lots of rails in the garden leading uh-huh. up to the front door oh, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Stair lifts and all that. Yeah, stair lifts and all that, and all, and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Well, those are what old people want these days. They don't want bungalows. And bungalows originally were built uh, post-Second World War because yeah. you don't need as many bricks to build a bungalow mm. as you do to build a house. You yes. see what I mean? There's and that desperate... song, Bungalow Bill, should... yeah. uh, the Beatles song from the White Album, yeah. uh, of course reminds me of Bungalow Bill that used to be Joan Collins' boyfriend. Aye, that's right. Who was once described by her yes. as like a bungalow. Yes. Uh, not much upstairs. That's right. And not everything upstairs. downstairs. Everything downstairs, not much upstairs. Yeah. It was a bit cruel, wasn't it? Also... Well, cruel, but also for him, I suppose, a bit of a backhanded compliment. I suppose so. He was also from Kent because he right. used to wear a badge saying, men of Kent can do it. Did all he? this kind of stuff, yeah. 
yeah. He's a very odd bloke. Yeah, he was a bit odd, yeah, yeah. but uh, but they are. Mm. But it says here, more profitable for, profitable for house builders to construct blocks of flats uh, on the second plot of land. Uh, bungalows built each year. Right. The number of bungalows built each year for the last 30 years uh, has dropped from almost 30,000 annually to just 2,000 mm. last year. And is it, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, is it yeah. not a kind of a regional um, a thing as well? Because you, for example, see quite a few... Yeah. In Scotland, there were a lot of places where you would see a lot of bungalows yeah. built. You know that kind of... Um, you know when we came to when you came to do the Edinburgh Festival, yes, and there's a section of the the city that you drive through, yes, which is not particularly well off section, that's right. But they've got that kind of grey, yeah, I know, um, almost very um, Irish like uh, yeah, landscape, yeah. yeah but it's mm. but the, the but the buildings themselves are made of that sort of grey. I don't know what you call it, yeah. but it's kind of like stucco almost. Yeah, that's um, right. You know, it's like it's sort of put on with a trowel. It's almost like papyrus. It's not, it's not brick. Yeah, well, no, no, papyrus is paper. Yeah, no, yeah, but it's nothing it looks, like papyrus. No, but it looks like it. But no, anyway, it's, no, it's grey stone basically. Grey stone. But an awful lot of how Houses in Scotland, in certain yes. parts of Scotland, yes. are bungalows. Yeah, well, that's right. That's right. Uh, it says here, uh, the Papworth Trust, a charity supporting disabled and older people, said if this carries on, there's a very real possibility we could be seeing the end of the bungalow. We'd call on the government to urgently look at this issue. I don't know what the problem is, actually. It says in three quarters of Britain's major towns mm. and cities, bungalows now count for less than 10% of all houses on the market. Uh, in Greater London, excuse me, Fewer than 1% of all homes on sale are listed as bungalows, with just 129 for sale across the entire city. In Aberdeen, there are only four bungalows four. for sale. Really? Mm. Well, that doesn't mean there's only four bungalows, does it? I mean, there's no. loads of... Well, I mean, a bungalow, I suppose, is... I hate not... bungalows, by Why the way. Why do you hate them so much? I just think people who live in bungalows are weirdos. But you don't need to live in a floor, uh, in, a, in a multi-floor uh, complex, do you? I can't sleep on the ground floor. Well, hang on, you, yeah, but you live in a, in a flat, right? Yeah. You don't live in a house. No. So, I mean, you've only got one level. Yeah. So, what's the difference? But it's, it's off the ground floor. I cannot live on the ground floor. Why not? Because I can't. I, I, I could not go to sleep on the ground floor. Why? Because I just don't know. There's something about it I just can't handle. But what is it? Is it some kind of fear? I don't know. Maybe, maybe some it's a... phobia? Maybe some phobia that somebody's going to break in through the window or really? something like that. Did yeah. you ever live on the ground floor in any house you've lived in? Never. I've never lived on the ground floor. Hmm. And in fact, um, one time we went to Scotland to do a show a couple of years ago. Yeah. And they wanted to put me in a below ground floor room. Did they? Believe it or not, yeah. Oh, in that hotel, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I and think that... I had one of those, yeah. yeah Very I, nice. I came back and I said, I'm not staying there. And they said, why not, why not? sir? I said, I don't stay on the ground floor. They said, no, no. It's below ground. I said, even worse. Right. I'll get me out of there. I want to go to the sixth really? floor. Yeah, I can't stand it. How bizarre. And I wonder if there's a name for that. Uh, a mate of mine lived in a bungalow, right? Yeah. Um, in uh, on the Wirral, uh-huh. and uh, I stayed over at his place uh, one night when we got, I got completely bladderated. Yes. And uh, I, you know, I, I, he showed me into a bedroom. Said, "Hey, oh, Mike, that's that's fine." I woke up in the morning and I, I opened the curtains, looked out the window, and I was. Palpably shocked that really? I was actually on the ground floor. Really? Which is not something I can do. How bizarre. No. Because there's a part of, um, uh, sort of between Bexhill and Cuden Bay. Right. I told you where Graham Norton's place is, right? It's not yes. far from there. Yes. Um, and it's a very long road, quite sort of wide road, yeah. like sort of quite expensive houses. Yeah. But all the houses are bungalows. Yeah, okay. And they're right overlooking the sea. So I mean, mm. if you're in one of these mm. on the left hand side of the yeah. road, You've got a sea view. Sure. And they're big. They're not mm. sort of tiny little places. No, I places, know what you mean. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they, they're all just one level. Yeah, I can't stand that, you see. I think you should go upstairs to bed. Yeah. Now, you say, oh, but you live well, on one level if you live in an yeah. apartment. Yeah, but you've already gone upstairs yes. before you've got in your no, apartment. I get, no, I get that. I yeah. mean, I just... I just it's so, so your hatred of bungalows yeah. is not about the one level because you need stairs. It's just that you don't want to sleep on the ground no, floor. No, I don't want to be anywhere near the ground floor. Mm. Or, or, you know... I, what I, if it was like on stilts? You know how, say, if you went to somewhere like Thailand yes. and you built a house on stilts, but it was just one level? Well, it would depend would how far right? off the ground it would be. I once oh, stayed at the Ants in uh, St Lucia, uh-huh. which was actually on stilts on the side of a mountain. Say 20 feet up or something. Yeah, that was all right, 30 or 40 that's feet okay. up. That's OK. Yeah, that's not, that's not a problem. Mm. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, bungalows, first of all, are associated with old people, and I'm not old yet, so I don't want to live in a bungalow. You're okay? not old yet? No, of course I'm not. Of course not. you're old. I'm early middle age. No, you're not early middle age at and, all. Uh, and secondly, I just think that the idea of not being able to... I don't know, get yourself off the ground floor is is very weird and, and I can't understand. You see, remember Michael Barrymore, obviously, and he's still around. I certainly do remember him. Well, you well know, he's not the, dead or anything, is he? No, he's not, no. But no. the shocking incident which marred his career involved a party at his... From which he has now extracted a rather large amount of compensation. Well, he's asking for it. No, he's already got some. I'm, think, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. I think, I think he's it's, already got some. I think it's in abeyance, to no, be I honest. I think he's already got some. But anyway, the point of my story is, when everybody took the aerial shots of his home, it was uh, an extensive... 
um, um, residence, but it was a bungalow, you know, right. with a swimming pool in the middle. And I thought to myself, if you can afford to buy a big house like that, why would you not buy a house on more than one level? Well, I mean... Well, it's his choice, obviously. Uh, well, yeah, his, and he might have just liked the setting. And yeah, I mean, exactly. like I said, these houses along uh, towards yeah. Cooden Beach yeah. or Cooden Bay mm. uh, are absolutely well, massive. I mean, they're huge houses. You go to somewhere on the coast where for, like, almost a century now, the, you know, the, the standard procedure is, oh, old people retire and go to the coast, right? So they built lots of bungalows on the coast. So if you go to somewhere like Lytham St Anne's, which is next to Blackpool, yes. you see lots and lots of bungalows. And if you go to somewhere like um, down on the south coast, uh, near to where my sister lives, uh, Bournemouth, Bournemouth and beyond, Lake. lots and lots yeah. of bungalows. You well, know, even that... in that section of the town where she lives, yes, that's I'm right. sure I saw a couple of very big houses which were just on one level. I don't Didn't think I? so. I don't think so, to be honest. But, you know, wherever you get a coast, you get bungalows. And, and, uh, and I've never liked them. I think they're a bit weird. To me, they're almost like... Um, you know, like a clown mm. has some sort of sinister aspect to him yeah. sometimes. Right. You know, the clown's face, yes. uh, you know, tears of a clown and all that. Uh-huh. I think bungalows are a bit sinister like that. Maybe, mm. maybe. I've never thought about it in that sense, yeah. to be honest. I yeah. mean, I've, I'm, I'm not as fussy as you about where I live. Mm. Mm. I wouldn't rule out living in a bungalow. Yeah. And in fact, I have heard uh, from the mother of my children that mm. she wouldn't mind living in a bungalow in the past. Really? But it's not something I particularly would look no, forward to. No, I wouldn't either. Mm. I wouldn't either. And And the other thing is that... I like to have a view of the world. How from... much cheaper? I mean, as a land uh, yeah. property expert, yes. in, uh, in mm. the many mm. other subjects mm. that you're an expert in, I mean, if you're buying a bungalow on a pro- piece of property, yeah. and next door is a house, say, three bedrooms with yes. two storeys, yes. is the bungalow substantially cheaper, or does it not matter? Well, the bungalow... Because uh, you could have the same number of bedrooms, for example. Exactly. It would depend on the square footage yeah. of the building, to be honest. Yeah. And, and on one level or two levels, it doesn't matter. It's about the square footage. So yeah. that it's not really comparable okay. in terms of the plot. It's right. comparable in terms of how many square feet uh, of living space is inside it. Yeah, you know? but I mean, if the plots are all the same size, obviously... Yeah. The bungalow plot is going to be smaller, isn't it? Uh, in not, a way. Well, not necessarily, because you can have things like garages and all that kind of stuff, which fill up the acreage of the. What if you the, had a bungalow and you could dig down and create a basement? No, I wouldn't be interested. I don't like these basement things either. I've mm. read about another, you know, multi billionaire who lives in Eaton Square or something. Just uh-huh. one permission to build a basement yeah. twice the size of the house oh. itself. This Which can't it, be good for no, the land. No, I, I don't think it can be. And, and anyway, I wouldn't want to, you know, they say, oh, we're going to a swimming pool and a sauna and leisure. I wouldn't want to be sitting in a basement uh, swimming pool, sauna and leisure, knowing that just the other side of those tiles yeah. is actual earth with worms are, you know, uh, crawling around <laughs> in and spiders and all that kind of stuff. Spiders? Yeah, well, they well, do. Spiders are above ground as well. Well, they are, as yeah, are yeah, worms. yeah. But I mean, you know, you know what I mean? I don't want to be burrowing down into the earth like, a, you know, I'm a, a mole, mole and I live in a hole, you know? I don't want that at yes. all. You're a man full of uh, superstitions and fears, aren't no, you? No, not really. You are. Not really. You I are. just like to live my life the way I like to live my life, You're okay? Walking contradiction. It's quite as simple as that yeah yeah what about being buried underground then no thank you that will never eh? happen no so you're not going to be buried you're joking i've made arrangements a to have uh make sure i'm injected with poison after i die so i really injected, am dead yeah injected with poison yeah yeah definitely yeah what Yes, definitely. I want to make sure I'm absolutely dead. Some people die, but then kind of, you know, don't die. <laughs> no, they don't. And so, A... If you're dead, you're dead. No, no. Some people can... You know why... Uh, you know, time, by the way. In Victorian times, when it was difficult to tell somebody yeah, was dead or not... We don't live in Victorian times. They used to attach bells to coffins. So, in, as you were being lowered into your plot, you'd ring the bell and say, hey, well, I'm so not dead. Let you out. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, but well, we don't live in uh, Victorian so I've, times. So, I've made absolute... Anyway, listen, the point is, sometimes people so just go into a coma... Then? Oh, definitely, I'm going to be cremated. Well, you don't want to be cremated if you're still alive either. Well, that's why I'm going to have an inje- <laughs> a poison injection before I um, uh, get into the coffin. Well, yeah, but or if... put the yeah. me in the coffin, so to speak. You know, <laughs> I'll give yeah. you it now if you like. <laughs> oh, no, no, we have only got 45 minutes show to but do. But also, I've thought, I've thought about this. I've thought that. If you woke up in a coffin, you're buried six feet under, yeah. that would be the most hellish experience in the world. It wouldn't be great. But you would die fairly quickly of, I'm told, of uh, lack of oxygen. Yes, I think so. so asphyxiation. Yeah, so you wouldn't actually be lying there for, you know, 14 days while no. you starve to death. It would be asphyxiation. But that's not pleasant anyway. It's not. But much better... To actually be, if you're still alive, but you're not, nobody knows you're still alive, yeah. rather than be cremated, because the heat of the cremation yes. fires mm. are so hot yeah. that the minute they touched your mortal well, soul, I don't know. I think that might you be would worse. die of a heart attack anyway. Yeah, but hang on. So, mm. so basically, but once you've been injected with poison yeah. and you're now dead as dead can That's be, right, yeah. what difference does it make if they bury you? 
uh, I just hate the idea of being but buried be anyway. Alive. But I hate the idea of being buried. I don't want to. Be, I don't want to end up six feet under the earth forever. So, I want... what, so what do you want to do with your ashes then? Uh, scatter them at sea, probably. Really? Yeah, at sea. Yeah, somewhere off Gosport. Gosport. Yeah, why not? You'll probably get nicked if you take them down there. <laughs> Stupid comment. <laughs> this is talk sport. Coming up next, we're going to bring in the winner of Heroes and Villains. <laughs> Sport, we are the two mics coming up very shortly. We're going to be talking to Professor Chris Turney, who's got a new theory yeah. uh, about Scott of the Antarctic That's right. and why he was uh, uh, doomed when he went on his expedition in 1911. Yeah. But I'm delighted to be able to tell you, Porky, mm. uh, that the uh, the vote has been cast, yeah. the democratic process yeah. is all but over, yeah. uh, and the three men, good but true, behind the glass have voted in the heroes and villains, mm. and they voted two to one yeah. in my favour. In your favour. Thank you. Oafs. Well, you could congratulate me. Oops, I have to say. You could congratulate me. Just, uh, well, why should I congratulate well, you? Because that's you know. what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be magnanimous. In this. Supposed to be magnanimous mm, in mm. defeat and or victory. I don't believe magnanimity. You can't even say it. I can. Say it again. Magnanimity. Magnanimity. Yes, no, it's magnanimity. Right. Magnanimity. That's what go. I said. There yeah. you go. Yeah. 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 So it's. Uh, I think that makes it um, mm. four three to me. Yeah. Well. So I'm edging ahead. Mm. So once yeah, I get so in, you say. I think I we should my, talk about other more important things. Once I get my nose in front, um, like, you never instance, catch me. Like, Captain Scott of the Antarctic. Uh-huh. Mm. Well, what do you want to talk about? Well, I'm going to talk about the fact that there's a new um, theory yes. has been introduced into the research documents uh, about uh, Captain Scott's brave and heroic uh, mission uh-huh. uh, to the South Pole yeah. and another new theory as to why it ended so cruelly for Captain Scott. OK, well, let's talk to the man with that theory. His name That's is right. Chris Turney. Yeah. Uh, he is, of course, uh, Professor of Earth Science and Climate Change at the University of New South Wales in Australia. Chris, a very good uh, morning to you, I should say, here. It's probably evening where you are. Yeah, hi, Mike. Hi, Mike. Great to be on with you. Yeah, well, thank you very much for joining us. Mm. Tell us about uh, this character that you've unearthed called uh, Teddy Evans, because it seems to me that you're maligning him. could have been a real villain. Maligning him in quite some bad way. I mean, if he was still alive, he'd be suing you for libel, wouldn't he? (laughs) I guess there's always that risk, Mike, yeah. Mm. Um, Yeah, well, it's a classic tale, isn't it? You know, he's a Wardian explorer. Scott did this incredible trip as a science expedition trying to get to the um, South Pole first and do a lot of science off the map. And, yeah. uh, and then tragically, he and his four colleagues uh, died on the journey home. And, and it was thought to be just bad luck or, or even bad planning on the part of Scott. But, uh, as you said in the intro, uh, we found a number of different documents scattered around the world that uh, appear to show that the, uh, the second in command, this guy you mentioned, uh, Lieutenant Teddy Evans, uh, who, who dislikes Scott immensely by the sounds of it, um, looks like he was stealing food and uh, not passing on orders. Mm. I mean, so the story goes that on their way to the South Pole, Evans was sent back to camp because he was suffering scurvy, which, of course, is uh, is um, a deficiency of vitamin it is, isn't it? Yeah. C, isn't it? I think so. Yeah, and uh, and uh, but on the way back, he, he uh, purloined rations which had been posted at various points so that the the uh, expedition would always have some food available he stole it all and then didn't obey an order to send out a relief dog sleigh team to help his crewmates on their return this guy sounds like a damned villain yeah well it's close to that he wasn't sent back because he had scared that was that was one of the uh, outrageous things. He, he only did that scary a lot later. He was just sent back with uh, one of the last teams. So um, they were all designed to do that. The teams came along dropping supplies and then and then peeled off. And mm. Scott decided at the last moment, well, it doesn't look like he had decided uh, at the last moment. He looked like he planned it all along. But Evans wasn't going all the way and sent him back. And one of the letters we found here over in Australia um, Appears to show Evans absolutely furious that he didn't go. But he, he didn't steal all the food either. He just took above and beyond what he was allocated. So um, it's that... a bit like anything in sports. Teamwork and teamwork, you know, sort of hazardous environments, especially somewhere like Antarctica. Yeah. If one of your teammates starts doing things against the team and basically looking out for himself, and it's rule 101 when you do expedition work. You just you look after everyone. And if, if you start looking out for yourself, it's a 
morale just collapses and mm. no one trusts it's anyone kind of thing, else. Uh, kind of thing you would get up to, Porky, I not would at suggest, because you're not really a team player. But, I mean, the thing about this whole expedition, Chris, is that we've read so much about it, haven't we? from uh, Captain Oates going out and saying, I'm going to be outside maybe sometime. Mm. You know, it's sort of a legendary t- tour. How has all of this evidence and all of these papers been kept hidden all these years? Well, I, it's a curious thing, Mike. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a historian. I'm a, I'm a scientist, but mm. I, I, I love history. And I like, when you, whenever you do any science, you, you test your ideas. And I don't like just uh, regurgitating what other people have, published and, and actually if you go back to the original sources and letters it's amazing i mean you find all sorts of things in fact where this folder where some of this evidence was from um you know there was a telegram from king george <laughs> saying how sorry he was to hear that scott had died you're actually handling that with your own uh, fingers it's just extraordinary the amount of history that's buried in there and i think there's probably a huge amount more not just the scots expedition other things that people just don't realize are in the archives and you just got to get back and do the, uh, do the hard labour and working through what's there. Mm, absolutely. I mean, we don't realise these days, do we, the privations that these guys went through um, over a century ago when they were going into such um, inhospitable terrain. I mean, there were no tracking devices to find out where they were. There were no helicopters to go and rescue them. You know, there were no modern forms of transport. They didn't have motors on their sleds and all this. It's absolutely unbelievable that anybody ever got back from an expedition like that, wasn't it? Yeah, God, I mean, I've been very fortunate. I've been out to Antarctica five times. And even today, when you're out there in the field, once you're outside contact, you can be you know, hundreds of kilometres from anyone else. And it's the most beautiful, brilliant landscape and environment mm. It, it can be quite wild, desolating, and when the wind's not blowing, it's almost Martian. It's almost deafening the silence. And 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 then all of a sudden, uh, a plane will arrive or a helicopter, and suddenly you whisk back to civilization. It's a complete abrupt shift. And Scott famously writing his diaries. I mean, they basically got no other form of communication. They're dependent on all this um, planning. And he's writing where are the dogs, where are the dogs sleds teams. Mm. And they never appeared. They yeah. never even came close. Right. And uh, it's heartbreaking. And maybe some of the listeners might have read The Worst Journey in the World by Cherry Gerard. It's an absolute classic. Mm. And uh, poor Cherry was uh, convinced for years it was his fault. Mm. And it wasn't anything of the sort. Yeah. It's well, a amazing, tragic really. tale, and really. It is, yeah. Mm. But it's a heroic tragic tale, if you well, know what yeah, I mean. Yeah, but I mean, you know, a dead hero mm. is not a hero to me. A dead hero well, is, is. Uh, you know, it's a guy who got it become, wrong. Well, that's one of the ways to become a hero, well, surely. yeah, but, but Chris, I'd rather be a live, normal person than a dead hero. Anti-hero. Yeah. That doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Um, the point is, Chris, as well, that... Um, I'm sure Scott would have been as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly right. I was mm. going to ask you, when you were out there in Antarctica, people that I've talked to who have been there describe a moment that everybody has where you basically lose touch with the horizon and you can't tell what, where the sky is and where the ground is. Did you did you get that? Yeah, sometimes you get the contrast. Well, the light's just uh, wrong. You can't tell the difference. You're on a skidoo. You're doing maybe 10, 20, even 40 kilometres an hour on a good open patch. But um, And then suddenly the light will go and then you have to slow right down. If people are going too fast, yeah, you can just drop down. Well, even crevasses, worst comes to the worst. Hmm. Uh, the other, the other extraordinary thing is, um, of, of course, when you're down there, a lot of the time, and most of us go down during the summertime, so it's 24-hour uh, daylight, right. hmm. and often there's no real dip in the sun in the sky. So, after a while, mornings and afternoons are completely abstract concepts. Yeah. You know, it's only because of a watch that you're aware of, it, whether it's the afternoon or the morning, compared to civilization. So, it's disorientating at a number of different levels, and Made the thing about Scott and the guys were not only did they do an incredible journey and really try to look out for each other as much as possible, they did science all the way. And if you read Scott's diary, that wasn't written afterwards. That was that was written at the time. So yeah. he was doing twelve hours pulling a sledge, yeah. dragging all his gear, and then writing this amazing prose at the end of it, mm. which I think most of us. I, I, when I write, I just say it's cold, rubbish. I feel really tired. Yeah. <laughs> He's writing this amazing literature. Absolutely. Extraordinary. 
You wonder what it what drives men to do that mm. sort of thing, you know, because I never would. I'm just not that heroic, you know. Well, I mean, we all know that. Yeah, no, but I mean, you know, to be pulling a sledge across, because it's not like you're pulling it across snow, the sort of snow that falls in your back garden in the winter. You're pulling it across brittle and sharp ice, aren't you? And in up and down... Well, they were explorers. Uh, crevasses okay. and hills, yeah. But, I mean, to me, I'd rather be at home with my feet up, you know, drinking a pint of ale in Fleet Street rather than pulling sleds around Tom's in the Antarctic. no surprise. Yeah, but, um, but uh, extraordinary men. I mean, mean, you know, absolutely extraordinary people who've, uh, who've broken the barriers of geographical um, adventure. Amazing men, amazing men. Well, I, and I think one of the things, Mike, not to, to forget is that we're familiar with what Antarctica looks like today, but even today, I've been lucky. I've been up a couple of uh, mountains and peaks, nothing yeah. major. But you suddenly, when you climb the top, you're suddenly getting a view that no other human being has ever seen yeah. in the, in the history of the world. You know, yes. and Scott was actually pioneering a route and climbing mountains and going through some areas that no one had ever seen before. And you know, if it only a hundred years or so ago, yeah. the bottom third of the southern hemisphere was largely unknown. So no, they were off the map. It, it was like the Edwardian equivalent of space travel. You know, mm, you're, sure. you're completely off the map. Did they have um, sunglasses in those days? Because you could go snow blind, couldn't mm. you? If you, uh, you know, if you, it was all day yeah. kind of light. Goggles of some kind, I suppose, right? Well, yeah, but would they have been able to protect their I, eyesight? I, I, I've had that myself. It's horrible. It really is. It, the bl- the blindness gets to you. It's um, it, it's so dizzying after yeah. a while. Yeah, you, you, your eyes are incredibly painful. They used to use cocaine, actually. They used to put, put cocaine in the eyes. Really? Just to uh, relieve the pressure on it a little bit. Yeah, so they, they travelled with cocaine. Well, we've, we've met a few people along the way who might have uh, quite enjoyed going to Antarctica yeah. in that case. I've never seen anyone put in their eyes before. <laughs> no, no. They probably wouldn't even be aware where they are. No. Thank God this is a family show. Listen, exactly, Chris, yeah. thanks very much indeed. Uh, Chris Turley, you, Chris. professor mm. uh, down there in uh, New South Wales. Uh, he's on his tour at the moment telling us about mm. new theories about the Scott of the Antarctic's doomed 1911 expedition. Fascinating stuff, I mean, really. I mean, he really is one of Britain's great heroes he to is. any you know, schoolboy growing yeah. up. You know, who are the heroes? Yeah, you know, yeah. Horatio Lord Nelson, yeah. Scott of the Antarctic, yeah. Christopher Columbus, you know what I mean? Christopher Columbus? Yeah. Well, he wasn't British, was he? No, he wasn't, but he discovered America, didn't he? Well, why would he be a hero for British kids? Well, he, anybody who discovered America is a hero, in my view. What Captain about Americo Cook? Vespucci? Captain Cook, huh? who discovered Australia, what? Yeah, Ameri- great hero. What about Americo Vespucci? Americo Vespucci? Yeah, he discovered America. Yeah, as well. he was Italian, wasn't he? He was, yeah. Yeah, that's well, right. Christopher yeah. Columbus was Spanish. Christopher Columbus was Spanish, mm. but he was. No, he wasn't. Christopher Columbus was Italian, mm. but he was funded by the Spanish well, court. OK, but yes. he certainly wasn't yes. British. Mm. No, no, of course he wasn't. No, yeah. I knew that. I Everybody knows that, mate. Tonight. Well, I mean, you know, that's a bit like... Who's the guy who went down the... Uh, You've the seen silk, the time. The Silk Trail. Hey? You know, the guy who went right across Asia. He was another famous Cook. explorer. No, I don't mean Cook. I mean, um, what was his name? I don't know. Yeah, he was uh, very, British. very famous. Well, I mean, for instance, the bloke British? who walked over the Alps with his elephants, he wasn't British either. Hannibal. Hannibal, yeah. Yeah, yeah but he's still a hero. Well, you call him a hero? Well, of course he Why? is. Why? An explorer. Well, you know, you these explorers are great you, people. Well, you just said you didn't think anyone who failed is a hero. Well, he didn't fail. He did fail. Hannibal he got beaten. Fail. He got beaten by the Romans. Well, that's because his elephants fell off the mountain. But that's because the mountains weren't really designed what for elephants to be walking on? over. What on earth are you no, going on about? They're ridiculous. I'd rather hear your views on the NFL, which, of course, are coming up after us tonight, mm. uh, because that's what we do now live at TalkSport. We carry you uh, all the uh, yeah. stuff from the United States of America. The Packers are playing the Cowboys. I might ask Porky about that coming up next on TalkSport. Mm. Talk Sport, we are the two mics. Uh, coming up after us, Will Gavin's going to be here uh, with the NFL Overnight Show. Uh, there's a little story about Mike Pence, actually, you know, the Ooh. vice president, yeah. who apparently got up and walked out of a game yes. uh, because these guys went and took a knee. That's right. And apparently Donald Trump is now claiming that it was at his request mm. that uh, Mike Pence actually left the Indianapolis yeah. Colts game yeah. uh, after the San Francisco 49ers did that. So we'll come back to that. Sure. A couple of tweets for you, though. Mm. Uh, here's one from um, Becky, who says, I can think of a few names for Porky's fear of living in a bungalow, mm. but it's a Family show. Yes. Mm. Huh? Yeah, I don't know what she means by that. Yeah, David says, there is a song on Black Sabbath's Volume 4 called Snowblind. Mm. I always assumed it was about cocaine. Mm. Well, maybe it was. No, I don't think it was. Oh, maybe it was, yeah. Maybe that's, uh, you know, the relevance to rubbing it in your eyes. Yes. Peter yes. says, listen to the two mics in the garden with a beer. Beats TV in bed. 
but I'm supposed to be up in five hours. OK, well, that's OK, mate. You enjoy your beer mm. and we'll try and keep you entertained. And here's one from Gif Gaff. Yeah. He says, Porky wants his corpse injected with poison. Mm. Unkind souls might mm. say Mike Perry's had enough poison residue in his makeup to suffice. That is very harsh. Yes. Uh, Pete here says, The crying baby nearby won't take away the joy of listening to the two mics at this time in the morning. Well, hope... Uh, Hope it keeps you happy, pal. No problem at all. Andrew's asking a question. He says, how does he go from bungalows to being burned alive in a coffin? Mm, well, you know, there's a big link between the two. Don't you worry Is about that. Right? that. Uh, and here's one from Adam mm. who says, Porky, you should watch the film Buried mm. if being buried alive is your worst Oof, fear. Golly, no, thank you. Was it, You know, um, Kill Bill 2? Yes. Didn't uh, Uma Thurman mm. get out of a, a coffin that she'd been buried she in? She might have done. Mm. I watched Kill Bill 1 yeah. and I didn't really like it, to be honest, and mm. I really like Uma Thurman. Mm. Um, so I didn't watch Kill Bill 2. I wasn't keen on all the kind of animation that they did over the yeah. top of the celluloid, you know? Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I yeah. didn't fancy that. All these weird things about meeting um, old, uh, you know, uh, Khan. Was it? No, uh, Khan? Chan. 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 Well, it's all a bit of that sort of, what do they you call know, in that? The desert um, and that's, uh, anime, they call yeah, that's it, right. I think. It's like Chinese, Japanese. Yeah, that's um, right, yeah. Japanese kind of, yeah. um, all that uh, kind of animated stuff. comics. All that kind of stuff. I'm not have keen. I, have I told people on air tonight, did I just tell you earlier, mm. about uh, Hillary Clinton coming to this country later in this week? Well, funnily enough, you told me in another podcast which will be out uh, oh, later right, okay. on in the week which is yeah. called On the Record On the Record if you've never right, heard yeah. it we've yeah. now gotten up to 23 uh, different uh, chapters we certainly have um, and the next one will be out Tuesday that's right yeah. if all goes well so I won't ruin the spell then because uh, she's coming to this country Hillary Clinton yeah. well you can there's no reason not to mention it she's going to be given a doctorate mm. uh, at a university in yes. the United Kingdom I'm quite surprised that she's worried about that sort of thing because I mean she's already quite decorated when it comes to... Well, she did a massive interview today in mm. the Sunday Times yes. in which she is now, the rest of her life is now ruined yeah. because she failed to win yeah. the election against... Well, uh, she'll never recover from that. Uh, she'll never recover from Donald Trump for two reasons. Firstly, she did not become the first woman president of the United States of America. And secondly, she feels that yeah. she's burdened her country, America, yeah. with a man who she thinks could well destroy the country mm. and she will take responsibility. She will have to take responsibility for not being able to find a way to beat him in the democratic process. But worse than that is, mm. is probably her mm. sort of knowledge that she was not as popular as a guy who is now thought to be you the know, most one of the most president of all time. ridiculous presidents mm. that America mm. has ever seen. But the university she's getting the degree from, yeah. believe it or not, is not Oxford or Cambridge or even one of the great sort of, London you know... School of Economics London or something School of like that. Durham University yeah. like that. It's Swansea. Is it? Swansea University. I'm really surprised that she's... She'll be awarded um, an honorary doctorate mm. On Saturday of this week. Yeah. I'm really surprised that she would do that on the basis that, you mm. know, um, she, it's not like she needs another doctorate. Yeah. I mean, she's got plenty of academic qualifications. Yeah, she, she has, yeah. I mm. mean, you're absolutely right. She's, uh, you know, she's one of the most highly qualified lawyers in America yeah. uh, for obvious reasons. That's, now, that's, I've got yeah. some interesting news for you. OK, good. Now, do you know that um, you said to me previously that you collect pound mm. coins in jars? Yeah. Not because um, you're a coin collector. No. But because you just kind of p keep putting them in there when that's you right. get home. That's you right. You take all your change out your pockets and you put them all in there. Now, you know the old one pound coin is about to be no longer um, I've just been notified. legal currency, right? The 15th of October is the last yeah. day you can spend it. Mm. Although you can take it to the banks after that. They cease to be legal tender on Sunday, supposedly. That's a week today. A week today? No, a week yesterday. Well, a week yesterday, week now yesterday, that it's yeah. you know, mm, mm, past half mm, past midnight. Mm. But apparently thousands of shops are going to ignore mm. the Royal Mint's deadline, but mm. it will still mean that you've only got a very, very short amount That's of time. Right. I mean, how much money in pound coins do you think you've got? Uh, a few hundred quid. A few hundred? Yeah. Shouldn't you just give it to the homeless or something? Well, well, it's no good to them if it's not currency anymore, is well, it? Well, they can use it quickly before the end of the week. No, if I, no, if I can find them all and get them all together, because yeah. in various jars around my um, properties. What sort of jars? Well, uh, I... A jam I, jars? Bigger? No, no. i tell you what I ended up using. Mm. Uh, giant tubs of um, coffee creamer. What? Coffee creamer. Coffee creamer? Yeah, you what know... What do you mean? Well, you know... Oh, like Coffee Mate, that kind of thing. That's right, Coffee Mate, yeah, oh, giant like tubs a, of that. Oh, they're jars, they're like plastic, aren't they? Uh, they're, I think they're cardboard, Are actually. They? sort of cardboard and metal. And, cardboard uh, and metal? Yeah, the, the base is metal, yeah. but the wrap-around bit is cardboard. OK, right. And I started putting them it's in there. It's really good for you, that stuff. Why do you use milk? Uh, I do use milk as well. As well? But it improves the flavour. The creamer improves the flavour well, of the so coffee. you put milk in your coffee and then you add cream? Y yes, I do, yeah, yeah. What? And then two sugars. But as I've decided to try and cut back on uh, sweet stuff, I don't drink much coffee anymore. Really? So I've got a few tubs of that stuff which I'm not using. Well, how many tubs did you buy? About three or four. Why? 
Uh, I How store them you... under my sink so right. I don't run out. <laughs> Your yeah. life is so weird. No, it's not. Even I can't imagine how weird no, it is. No, it's not. It's not. But anyway, I mean, under the sink is where you're supposed to put things like your fairy liquid. Yeah, well, that's all you there know, as well. You're kind of. Your, about your, that. Your, I'm not yeah. worried about it. Yeah, yeah. Your brushes, you know, mm. your scouring mm. pads. Yeah, yeah. That's you know, all there. It's maybe all your there. paper towels, all spare there. ones. Don't worry. But not coffee, mate. Well, I couldn't find anywhere else to put it because all the other. Uh, uh, kitchen cupboards are full. Right. Of... Well, full of all your spare kettles. Uh, no, no, not really. No, they're in the they're in the storeroom, spare room. Now, what I was going to say is, when you die, right, your mm. place will be a right Aladdin's cave for somebody well, just to go in and it may and well go be. Through. It may well be. But what I've decided to do is, mm. I'm going to go to a local supermarket where they've yeah. got one of these machines. Oh yeah. Where you can tip all your money in. Yes. And what comes out are vouchers. You get like a piece of paper, don't you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And saying you spend all this. So you have to spend it there. Yeah, but I don't mind that because I, I use it's a Morrison's actually, and I use it quite often anyway. So oh, yeah. I thought, well, that's not a bad idea, yeah. and that'll save me. Well, it depends how heavy these jars are. Doesn't well, it? Uh, you know, they're they're about. Um, I would say that they weigh each one about the weight of three bricks. Yeah, well, that's quite heavy. Yeah, that's quite heavy. But I can take them in the car. You see, and uh-huh. you can park in the car park, and you then put them in a trolley. Uh, could and you do. can wheel them in like the old miser comes could, in I, with all his old coins. <laughs> well, uh, I wouldn't be you like know, that. Scrooge. Uh, but I'm not sure how... M- I'd like to film that. I'm not sure how many, you know, uh, tubs of coins yeah. at one time you can put in this machine I think should film it. overloading it or something. I think I took yeah. one of my kids to one once. Oh, did you? Because they had a, a collection of sort of, you right, know, okay. coppers. And you did know. it work? Oh, yeah. 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 But, yeah. I mean, it wasn't anything, you know, massive. It was no. about nine quids worth of No, well, two, I'll let you know how much money I get out of it. For Can we not film it? Can we send somebody with you? I'd love to see that on I'm film. I'm not sure, because I do it very early, because I get a, the local, uh, my local supermarket opens at six, so I'm uh-huh. usually in there by ten past, as you I, know, because I once um, took a picture of myself shopping there at uh, ten past six on you? Saturday morning. I don't remember that. Before we came in here. Yes, don't you remember? No. And everybody said, oh, why are you shopping in the wine aisle at ten past six on a Saturday oh, that's, morning? Yeah, that's true. But in fact, I wasn't. I just happened to be passing the wine aisle when the ah, picture was taken. OK. Mm. You just happened to be passing the wine aisle. Yeah. Now, listen, I've got some info. Go on. Um... There have been for years talk about, uh, well, you know, London should declare itself as an independent republic oh, within yeah. the United well, Kingdom. Sadiq Khan's not in charge of it. Yeah, that's right. Or, or ev- everything inside the M25 should be a separate country to the rest of the United Kingdom because that's where all the wealth generated, OK? Right. Yeah. Well, guess what? Um, Yorkshire is now considering the same plan. Yorkshire? Mm. What, you mean they want UDI, whatever they call it? Radical plans to turn Yorkshire into a country within a country with a powerful mayor to rival London uh, have been discussed within the uh, county itself. Really? Yeah. But do you remember when they had this whole idea of devolution, right? And Mm. they were stupid enough to not only think about giving it to Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland, but at one point they were also going to give it to, like, the North East, weren't they? They were going to give it to Newcastle. That that, that wasn't actually devolution, what that was. That was John Prescott's mad scheme to introduce regional councils. Yes, but it was going to be more than just a mayor, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was going to be an actual, like, regional council. Like a mini parliament. But he wanted the first one to be based in Hull, which was his constituency, to run Yorkshire. Now, what it says here is Mm. that this has been seriously considered by uh, a team of civil servants. Oh, yeah. Uh, the plan seeks to put a single leader in charge of Yorkshire because the economy of Yorkshire, it says here, and I didn't know Yorkshire was this uh, prosperous, the £110 billion a year economy of Yorkshire is around twice the size of Wales oh, yeah. and larger of larger than that of 11 countries currently in the European Union. Mm. OK? Yeah. The Yorkshire devolution currently has the backing of 17 out of 20 of Yorkshire's council leaders who've united under a one Yorkshire banner. The national and local Conservative and Labour parties are already exploring options for mayoral candidates. But surely the, the, the three ridings of Yorkshire can't even agree on which bit of Yorkshire is the most important. No. So how could they possibly be one kind of, you know, voice? I don't know. I thought this might have been one of those kind of, you know, joke stories, I wouldn't say April Fool's Day, because April's not here, obviously. Well, it is a Sunday, so as you've said before, yeah. uh, rather, shall we say, kind of sneeringly mm. about Sunday newspaper journalists, you know, they sometimes cook up stories yeah. because they've got nothing better to do yeah. uh, than come up with sort of stuff which doesn't always pan out, no. shall we say. Apparently, mm. um, Labour have 
questioned Ed Balls about being their nominated I'd like character. I'd Ed Balls. Yeah, uh, to so lead a lot it. Of Norwich City fans. And the like Conservatives well. would say, well, we've got a very good guy in William Hague, who was a Yorkshireman. William Hague, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, who could... Uh, we could lure him out of political <laughs> retirement to become the first leader of a free Yorkshire. That's actually very and, good. Oh, let me tell you, if we were a free Yorkshire, I would lead it there and I would be drinking 14 pints of beer a yes. day, like I did when I delivered my dad's beer. Have you met my man? Of lovely wife, f- f- yeah, Fionn. Yeah, 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 and Fionn and I, we we <laughs> are Yorkshire folk, but we love Wales. Yes. Uh, the fact that Yorkshire is very much more prosperous than Wales yeah. always proved what I thought about them Welsh people. Yeah. A bunch of dumbheads, yeah, in my view. Please don't ask me about that weird mm. story about the guy that shared a room with me. Yeah, I do not want to talk about <laughs> this story about the man who shared a room with me, because that's nothing to do with people, and I'm a very bright boy. Exactly right. Now, um, MPs will discuss the plans on Tuesday. It's in the time, by the way. In a debate table by uh, a Labour MP called John Grogan. I mean, that's amazing. That's that. ridiculous, though. It is ridiculous. I mean, do people not realise? I mean, see what's going on in Spain right now, mm. OK? They have a, a referendum, uh, which the Spanish say is illegal. They send in the cops to yeah. start cracking heads, yeah. start stealing ballot boxes. Meanwhile, the people in Catalonia say, oh, no, we've already had the vote mm. and we've actually voted to be independent. Mm. Yeah. So what we're going to do now is we're going to declare that we are, in fact, independent. Yeah. Meanwhile, yesterday, there's another demonstration by a load of people from Catalonia. In Barcelona. Say, in Barcelona. We don't want to we leave Spain. To... We want to be part of Spain. But at the same time, mm. the Spanish national team now, when it fields players who are Catalonians, yes. are getting booed. Yeah, exactly. players are getting booed. And also some of the Spanish uh, Catalonians yeah. are saying we don't want to play for Spain now That's because right. of the way they treated our people. Yes. I mean, it's not a very good idea to break up countries. I, I think in it's my, a, in it's my a view. shocking idea. By the same Absolutely token, I don't idea. think it's a particularly brilliant idea mm. to break up the European Union, but that's another story altogether. Yeah. Now, uh, we've got loads and loads of tweets and loads of text to do as well. Yeah. We haven't got a lot of time to do them in, mm. uh, and the NFL is going to be taking over at one o'clock yes. to talk sport. Yes. Where is my mind? Talksport, we are the two mics. Mark is asking a question. Has Talksport turned into the History Channel? Mm. No, Mark, but it has turned into a channel uh, at this time of night where yeah. you get informed uh, right. as well as being entertained. Yeah. And we don't just go on and on yeah. about whether Gareth Southgate should be fired. Exactly. Or whether Gareth Southgate should be removed just yeah. for the World Cup. Well, how can or... we improve the England team? Yes. No, boring. We're Mark not getting into that. Has then adds, the NFL is rubbish, simple as that. Mm. He's not a man with much of a wide range, is he, Mark? Yeah. I've had a message here from Captain Jam Tart. Oh, yeah. He says, uh, I'm surprised that uh, Porky hasn't mentioned that today would have been John Allen's 77th birthday. That can't be right. Well, Surely I, you would have known that. Uh, well, maybe I should know that, but, I mean, I'm not obsessed by John Lennon, so... What? Uh, so <laughs> I wouldn't know it. Of course now, you are. No, it's a very good one here from James, which I've got to clear up. He, he says, Mike, I just spat out my cocoa everywhere. Porky's outstanding... Sorry, astounding, not outstanding, astounding and shocking quote, a dead hero is not a hero. Remind him of two world wars. You're absolutely right yes. there, James, and that was completely well, misinterpreted by yes, me. I what think- I meant was, a dead hero is... Like, of course, he's a hero, but he's a a person, man or woman, because we had many, many female heroes during the Second World War as well. They're called heroines, aren't they? Special operations. Well, perhaps not called heroines now, because that would be gender-specific. And what I'm saying is that a a hero, when dead, can no longer contribute to the world anymore, and they've done brilliant things. Uh, And a dead hero is, you know, such a special thing to have in the history of your country. Uh Um, what What I should really have said was, a dead hero is a hero to that point and no longer because then it's all over, you know what I mean? Yes, yeah. but I think uh, the concept is something that you've slightly mis-explained because obviously yeah, you, I can have. Be a, you can be a hero and be a dead hero. Of course you can. You know, I mean, in fact, it, many ways, you can't be a hero unless you are dead. Yeah, I totally agree. The yeah. greatest Briton ever, in my view, is Admiral Lord you know, Horatio Nelson. And he is dead. And he is dead, of course, and he died on the battlefield. He died on the deck of his ship, HMS Victory. Hey, look, you make Liam Gallagher's on uh, Graham Norton's show. He certainly is, yeah. On one yeah. of our internal monitors That's here. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. We saw Graham Norton the other day. We did, yeah. We were out uh, filming uh, just a couple of streets away yeah. uh, here in Southwark, so yes. to speak, in London. Well, he used to have an office him, in this building, didn't he? Yeah, he did, yeah, and we saw him walking his dog. Now, but anyway, look, of course, of course, of course uh, dead heroes are heroes, and uh, my apologies for mis-explaining Oh, I don't that. think you need to apologise. I don't yeah. think there's any need for that. Yeah. Uh, Martin says, Porky should greet Hillary Clinton at Heathrow, model citizen and great portrayal of Great Britain. Yeah, I think you could be right there, but... Uh, you I have know, not been asked, have you? I never quite agreed with much she said. 
I'd met her once in uh, down in uh, Arkansas. In yeah. fact, on the night they won the election. Uh, now then, Matthew here, he's putting you two rights here. He says, uh, please that? remind MG, Columbus landed in the Caribbean, yeah. but never went to North America. Yeah. Um, yeah, but he's true, still actually. credited with with discovering parts yeah, of, of the Americas. Of course he is. You know, that's my point. Yeah. Uh, Becky says, there's a brilliant come from behind win for the Packers, 35-31 in Dallas. Aaron Rodgers to Devant Adams with 13 seconds left. Yeah, OK. That's a bit of uh, NFL for you. Because yeah, you did so NFL. well in the quiz that now I assume when we go home tonight, you're going to mm. start watching it all, aren't you? Uh, no. Really? No. Now, we haven't got an Ask Porky on right now, but we may do one later in the week. Yes. But Stu has sent in a question to you. Should I stay home alone tonight or get bladderated on Canadians' Thanksgiving? Uh, he says, hashtag, he's newly divorced. Well, if if you're Canadian, then I'd go and get bladderated on Canadian Thanksgiving. But other than that, I wouldn't, because what is the Well, force? I presume uh, Canadian Thanksgiving is tonight. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, Canadian Thanksgiving. So Canada was, like, founded with the cessation of the Americas at some stage, wasn't it? I presume so. I don't so. quite know about the foundation of Canada and why America's well, not one obviously there was country. a big French contingent, wasn't there? Because you have there was uh, a big Quebec, French contingent, yeah. uh, which is still yeah, a French, one true. of the few French-speaking parts of That's North right. America. Yeah, it must have all been to do with the War of Independence. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Now, uh, before we go, because we've got yeah. an awful lot of time left, yeah. uh, should we have a look at some of the stories on the back pages? I think we should. Uh, because mm. we have kind of studiously and quite deliberately ignored the England result, partly because, one, it didn't matter, it was a dead rubber. It was. Two, They'd already qualified to go to Russia. That's right. Uh, however, most of the back pages are still yeah. leading on it. Mostly yeah. been more pictures of Harry Kane. Mm-hmm. Uh, Harry Lineker, it says on the back page of The Sun, Southgate calling him the best striker we've had in 20 years. Yeah, But you don't have to be too bright to work that out, do you? Well, I not mean, really. He's so good at what he does now. Not really. Yeah. Hooray Kane, mm-hmm. uh, says uh, at the star. Yeah, um, I don't know if you've got some of them there. Oh, you? I have. Yeah, Le- uh, but Lewis Hamilton is also on every back page. Lewis yeah. Hamilton is on the brink of being crowned world champion for a fourth time. Yeah, thirty-two-year-old Brit won the Japanese Grand Prix. Leads rival Sebastian Vettel by fifty-nine points. Of course, he's going to win it. Yeah. We all know that. The other one is Fellaini blow for United. Yeah, do you know what? I nearly made Roberto Martin as a villain, right? Because Fellaini is out yes. as a result. I know it's not you know Martinez's fault. but yes. he was playing for Belgium. Yeah, and Fellaini's a pretty tough character. Pretty tough. And for character. him to be badly injured enough to miss some games for United. Mm. That's bad news for Jose, though. Uh, bad news for Jose. You've got to remember, though, the big gangly guys can always be subject to injury. That's why Andy Carroll would... I, I'd be horrified if uh, he was considered to be, you know, a suitable buy for Everton mm. because he spent so much time injured. I can't believe and, that's a good, that's going uh, concern. And, and, that. and that's because he's such a big guy, OK? Yeah. Um, the other one is Strack Payne is O'Neill's gain. Scotland missed out on the World Cup playoffs last night, yeah. but made sure Northern Ireland got through before they had even kicked off in Norway. Yes. That's because of this uh, table of uh, second place That's teams, right, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And Strachan waits on his future after Scotland come up short, is what it says on the back of the Guardian, yeah. saying that basically yeah. what we were telling you earlier, Gordon Strachan refusing to discuss his future yes. by basically palming it all off and saying yeah. the main thing now is to make sure these boys are OK because there's nothing worse than the feeling that they are currently feeling. That's right. Well, I can accept that, yeah. but I'm sorry, you know, there will be Scottish fans mm. who want him to give them an answer, yeah. i.e., uh, when are you leaving? Yes, abs- you're absolutely right. You know I mean? uh, on the back of the Telegraph, by the way, mm. something here which, uh, which uh, struck a chord with me. Uh, Bob, uh, uh, sorry, Rob Andrews' brilliant new book, right, right, is being published. That's a rugby book, obviously. Yeah. And they've chosen as the first excerpt in the Telegraph, the World Cup shambles. Oh, the yeah. first thing he says was, <laughs> he said, right from the start, I could see Lancaster losing focus and the plot. Mm. Now, talking about Stuart Lancaster. That's him. Now, we had some conversations with our own rugby correspondent. Russell Hargreaves. Russell Hargreaves. Yes. A long, long time ago, I said, Lancaster looks like a school teacher, Russell. Yes. He doesn't look like he's got the leadership no. qualities. Russell defended him avidly until the moment came when, of course, England got booted out. The first uh, team to host a Rugby World Cup and not even get through the qualifying do you know stages. I, do you know what I watched last night? What? Uh, which I've seen before, Invictus. Have you seen yeah. that film? Invictus. It's a fantastic film. It's the uh, it's sort of the, the celluloid version mm. of Nelson Mandela's South African World Cup. Oh, OK, you know, yeah. Where, where uh, uh, Pinar, well, Francois Pinar, yeah. captain South Africa to a win. That's right. For the first time under Nelson Mandela's leadership. Under the Rainbow Coalition. Exactly right. And, what a great film. And Francois Pinar, yeah. I interviewed a couple of times did when you? I was the rugby correspondent at the 2007 Rugby World Cup in France. Did you know who he was? I did, yeah, did down you? in Marseille. Yeah. Unlike your mate who you were working with. Oh, yeah, well, that's right. 
Mr. Campesi. Yes. Yeah, that was a bit of a blunder. Yeah, but I tell you what, if you haven't seen it, it's Morgan yeah. Freeman as Nelson Mandela, yes. who's brilliant, and Jason Bourne, one of your favourite actors, right, right, yeah, as Francois Pina. Really, really yeah. good. Okay, really well worth. Because funny seeing. enough, I was uh, surfing through the few channels last night, uh-huh. Saturday night, when we were in, oh, yeah. and I came across Goodwill Hunting. Oh yes. Now that stars Jason Bourne. It does. I've never found out what the plot of it is. Is it about hunting? Um... It's nothing to do with hunting. No, no. no it's it? a story about sort of education, I think. Uh, yeah. And he is this kind of gifted but slightly troubled young man. Yeah. Um, and he, he finds um, solace with a teacher yeah. who decides to sort of bring all the talent out of him mm. and everybody else has kind of given up on him. Right. It's that kind of idea. Yeah. But I, I think Robin Williams plays the... Robin uh, Williams plays the, the role of the, the teacher. teacher. Yeah. But you know what? And I hate to speak ill of the dead. Yeah. I'd never, ever appreciated Robin Williams as an actor. Oh, he was tremendous. I, I, you should I, see Good Morning Vietnam. I have seen Good Morning Vietnam. You like that? I think he overacted in that. I think he overacted in most of the films he did, right. including uh, what was the Peter Pan one? Eh? Captain uh, Hook. Captain Hook, yeah. yeah. I think he overacted in that. Oh, well, he overacted go. in A Night at the Museum. Well, unfortunately, we're running out of time before you can slag anybody else off thought who's dead. he overacted in, eh? uh, you know, in uh, a couple of other films. Thank you. Yeah. 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 He thought very highly of you, of course. Oh, yeah. okay. Perhaps he'd like to burn you to death in a coffin. That's a bit harsh. Let's talk sport. Stoptober. The 28-day Stop Smoking Challenge is back, and it's bigger than ever. Perfect timing! The two mics will be investigating just what it takes to quit in a series of intriguing, candid, one-on-one interviews with sports celebrities who've quit the smoking habit for good. It's a huge goal for him! Join the thousands of people who are stopping smoking this Stoptober with the two mics on Talk Sports. Come on, join in. Search Stoptober for all the support you need to stop smoking.